My name is Jane Carpenter Rock, and I am Deputy Director for Museum Content and Outreach here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to the second Margaret Z. Robson Symposium, We Are Made of Stories, Selfhood and Experience in Art. Thank you for joining us today. I bring you greetings from our director, Stephanie Stiebisch, who regrets she could not join us today. She is traveling in Europe for work, but also thanks you for your presence. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home in this region, the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered, and the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing this historic building. Thank you. Today, four speakers will share their insights on artists whose work is featured in our current exhibition, we Are Made of Stories, Self-Taught Artists in the Robson Family Collection. This exhibition, organized by Sam's Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art, Leslie Umberger, traces the rise of self-taught artists in the United States and charts the tremendous impact they have had on the larger picture of American art. It also celebrates an extraordinary gift that Douglas O. Robson made to Sam in 2016. 93 artworks collected by his mother, Margaret Z. Robson. Mrs. Robson, who passed away in 2014, embraced art that reflected diverse and personal journeys. She also supported museums and scholars in making this work more available to the public. Her son, Doug, now carries these efforts into the future. Two years after the original gift, Doug honored another vision of his mother's as well endowing, in her name, an ongoing symposium series at SAM, ensuring that scholars researching and publishing in this special and still under-recognized area of self-taught art would have a forum for presenting their work, sharing in a cross-pollination of ideas, and helping a general audience appreciate this material more deeply. The Robson gift of art and program support comprises one of the largest outright gifts to Sam in the folk and self-taught area in the museum's history. I would like to thank Doug for his important and wonderful gift to the nation. <laughs> Sam's collection of work by self-taught artists began in 1970 when James Hampton's astonishing throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium General Assembly came to light in a makeshift studio here in Washington, not far from the museum, shortly after the artist passed away. Several donors made it possible for this now iconic work on view in the galleries adjacent to the Robson exhibition to serve as the foundation of a collection that aims to tell an expanded, more humane, and more enlightened story of America and its people. Sam was also one of the first museums to, estab to establish a curatorial seat dedicated to artists who learn on their own away from academic and professional training. Leslie Umberger became the inaugural curator in this area in 2012, and since then, Sam's collection and scholarly record have grown in scale and stature. Leslie has even helped us understand how the concept of self-taught usually doesn't tell the whole story. We are extremely proud of Leslie and her ongoing scholarship. Many collectors and supporters have helped to shape Sam's now renowned collection over the years. And I want to thank all of them, including many here today, and including supporters who have helped bring this exhibition and its catalog to fruition. Doug Robson's gift to the museum will help Sam tell new stories to new audiences and will have a profound impact on the public's understanding of American art. Now I will hand the program over to curator Leslie Umberger, who will introduce today's presenters. Thank you, Jane. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here today. We're thrilled to see everybody. And I also thank Doug Robson, whose endowment has supported the important work of the speakers that we're about to hear from. And I also am grateful to the filmmaker Rushi Mittal and the artist George Tamahana Nuku for putting words to the idea of people as the living embodiment of their memories, experiences, and perspectives. 
These words that were expressed in different contexts, but beautifully synchronized in meaning, inspired the title of the exhibition and symposium, We Are Made of Stories. Today, we will hear about artists whose personal stories were or are deeply enmeshed in the art they made. The exhibition project confronts marginalization, uh, issues of marginalization that have, in the context of American art, extended far beyond the bounds of self-taught versus academically trained. And collectively, the 43 artists in We Are Made of Stories shape a narrative not one expressly of difference, but one revealing the gathered force of self-determination. The project charts a history of individuals spanning a century who worked independently, but whose endurance and drive to tell their own story in their own way affected profound change. In the 25 years that I've focused my own efforts on such artists, I've witnessed important change in the way both museums and audiences think about, speak about, see, and understand self-taught artists. I want to acknowledge here at the start that the words we use to describe makers whose practice is more organic than academic are never simple, and that categories used for describing people are inherently problematic. That even as they help describe commonalities, categories can sometimes do more damage than good. Sam uses the terms folk, self-taught, and neurodiverse as points of departure for more nuanced assessments. Folk gestures towards learning pathways that are predominantly communal or tradition-based. Artists more aptly described as self-taught follow learning paths that are primarily, sometimes entirely, singular. And the language encompassing artists with developmental or cognitive disabilities or facing mental health challenges is ever evolving, but prioritizes person first ways of describing a universe of situations. It is fair to say that all artists grow over time, learn in myriad ways, and are impacted by the era, place, culture, and biological specificity of their lives. Of the 43 artists included in We Are Made of Stories, over half of them were born in the 19th century. Close to half were African American. Only two of them are living. Many of them died before their creativity was ever noticed or appreciated. Some of them enjoyed modest support during their lifetimes, but only a few of them lived to see significant acclaim. All of these artists faced challenges of being recognized as artists, and they raised important questions about the power of language and art world structures, and they evidenced the many ways in which humanity regularly defies encapsulation. Our symposium today dials in on a very short list of creative individuals who changed the art world in specific and lasting ways. I'm grateful to my colleagues who are speaking today, I'm grateful to them for doing the ongoing work of changing American art history one story at a time through their important research, exhibitions, and books. Before I introduce them, I want to announce that Professor Sharon P. Holland, who is going to speak on the artist Sam Doyle today, is regrettably unable to join us, and we've adjusted the schedule a bit accordingly. Mark Pascal, who will kick things off, is the Janet and Craig Duchossois Curator in the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago, and Senior Lecturer in Print Media at the School of the Art Institute. He's also a lithographer with an in-depth knowledge of both contemporary and historical techniques of printmaking. Mark has been deeply involved in the Chicago art world for 40 years, curating and authoring a very impressive array of exhibitions and publications on artists, including Martin Purrier, Charles White, Ligia Pape, and the collective known as the Harry Who. Today, Mark will draw on his most recent exhibition and book, Joseph E. Yoakum, What I Saw. Following Mark will be Lisa Rundquist, Professor of Art History at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. Lisa has curated numerous exhibitions on artists including Henry Darger, Thornton Dial, Minnie Evans, Lonnie Holly, and Martine Ramirez. Her publications have considered The Quilters of G's Bend, The sculpture, Sculptor Noah Purifoy, 
and the nature of performance in the work of self-taught artists. Her talk today will draw on the 2021 co-curated series, Henry Darger, The Room Revealed, at Chicago's Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, as well as her most recent publication, The Power and Fluidity of Girlhood in Henry Darger's Art. We will then take a uh, break during which you can walk through the exhibition if you've not been able to. And then we will resume with Catherine Gentleson, the Mary Ann Dan Boone Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta and co-executive editor of Panorama, Journal of the Association of Historians of American Art. Since she joined the High in 2015, Katie has curated more than a half dozen exhibitions and, and expanded the museum's collection in important ways. Her 2018 reinstallation of art by self-taught artists included newly acquired works by Thornton Dial, Lonnie Holly, Henry Church, and many others. Katie's most recent exhibitions, Gate Crashers, The Rise of the Self-Taught Artist in America, and Really Free, The Radical Art of Nellie Mae Rowe, both debuted at the High in 2021 and began concurrent national tours that are ongoing today. Katie's presentation will be on the artist Nellie Mae Rowe. And anchoring today's program will be Matthew Higgs, a practicing artist as well as the director and chief curator of White Columns, New York's oldest non-for-profit alternative space. Matthew's writings have appeared in more than 50 books and exhibitions and publications, and he is currently contributing editor at the Paris Review. Matthew has become widely recognized as an advocate for the work of self-taught artists, and since 2004, he has collaborated extensively with Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland, California, presenting the work of artists affiliated with this pioneering progressive studio program in exhibitions that have been seen around the world. Most recently, Matthew organized Creative Growth, a five-decade retrospective of this groundbreaking organization for the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. My co-moderator my, my co for the concluding conversation is Tom DiMaria. Tom became Creative Growth's executive director in 1999 and today serves as director emeritus. He is also a board member of DisArt, a national disability cultural organization. For over 20 years, Tom has developed partnerships with museums, galleries, and international design companies, effectively and meaningfully bringing creative growth artists with disabilities into contemporary art settings and conversations. In 2019, Tom received the Visionary Award from the American Folk Art Museum in New York, and this past year he contributed an essay, Shifting Focus, A Brief History of Disability Art in Global Contexts, to the book Nonconformers, A New History of Self-Taught Artists, edited by Lisa Slominski. Today's presentations will be followed by a discussion. For those of you joining us online, you may use the comment chat to pose questions to the presenters. For those of you here in the auditorium, please write questions on the comment cards included in your program, and these will be collected as the last lecture concludes. If you'd like your question to be addressed by a specific speaker, please indicate that on your card as well. And lastly, for those of you who are here in person, we hope that you'll join us in the auditorium lobby following the program for a reception. Please make sure that all of your electronic devices are silenced. And with that, please help me welcome Mark Pascal to the stage. Thank you for being here. This is Joseph E. Yoakum, born probably 1891 in Ashgrove, Missouri, and died on Christmas Day in Chicago, Illinois, in 1972. Yoakum was born in the Jim Crow South um, from a, with a, f a family of nine children. His father was a farmer, African American. His mother was born into slavery. It's very likely that there was um, a touch of Native American blood in him, 
Um, even though he professed to be one thing, in fact, um, he was African-American first and foremost. He left home at the age of nine after having very, very little schooling and traveled with circuses, um, eventually becoming a valet for John Ringling, traveling with Buffalo Bill Circus, um, worked as a laborer, um, literally traveled very far away from where he grew up. Um, he professed to have seen every image that he drew, although, of course, he, hadn't, he wasn't looking at them when he drew them uh, after he started drawing in the early 1960s in, in Chicago. He started drawing by his own admission in 1962. Uh, in fact, the Art Institute, um, which has the largest collection of his work um, in anyone's hands, has uh, a drawing dated 1962 as the earliest inscribed drawing that, that we own, and I have never seen one inscribed even earlier than that. So we assume that um, his project as we know it really started in 1962, uh, at which he was around 77, 78 years old. He moved to Chicago in the early 1940s and um, lived in various places, but settled uh, in Avalon Park on East 82nd Street, living in a storefront for a good portion of the time that he made art, which is interesting because a storefront is the place where artists like to, like to live and work because it's a great combination space. But this is where he was uh, discovered, if we could call it that, um, by somebody who could help him. Uh, an anthropologist who taught at Chicago State University, which is very, very close to where Yoakum's um, residence was, named John Hobgood, was picking up dry cleaning at a cleaner next door to, to Yoakum and noticed in the window um, a number of drawings hanging from a clothesline above a uh, privacy curtain. He knocked on the door and Yoakum answered and invited him in. And he was mar marveled at the drawings and bought about 20 of them and took them over to a Presbyterian church nearby where the man on the left, Harvey Pranian, was the um, uh, acting minister and director. And Harvey had a, uh, a kind of hangout space in the basement of the church called The Hole, W-H-O-L-E, which was kind of a hippy-dippy coffee shop where poetry readings happened. Um, he had a gallery of sorts and you can see on the, in the image on the right with Mr. Yoakum standing in the gallery with his drawings thumbtacked to tackboard. It was basically a foyer that had a little chair, it had a, a payphone, and I think you can probably see here and here, there are announcements. So it wasn't really very formal. Um, I think uh, if, if Yoakum really knew what was going on um, in, a, in a kind of art world way, he would have objected to those notices being placed between his artwork. Um, notably, in, this, in these pictures, you can see a lot of cards that say sold. The show was remarkably successful. Um, they had to change it out about midstream. It was up for quite a while. And apparently, Mr. Yoakum visited often uh, during its run, talking to students, lecturing about his work, as somebody characterized it. Um, Harvey, um, who I've interviewed many times over the years, um, didn't have very strong reaction or memory of, of Mr. Yoakum, just that he was a kind of solid, intense, quiet man um, who made beautiful drawings. And they were quite popular. Um, at the time the show was up, uh, another artist by the name of Tom Brand, a graduate of SAIC and the owner of an offset printing company called Galaxy Press, visited the hole because he was printing stationery for Harvey and he went in to check with a job and saw Yoakum's drawings. Um, you can see here a poster that Tom designed and printed for Mr. Yoakum's first probably his only commercial show that he authorized during his lifetime, which was at Edward Sherbane Gallery on North Clark Street in Lincoln Park, Chicago, which is now a very, uh, very well-to-do part of the city, but at the time was kind of a, a hub for um, uh, vagrants. You know, it was kind of a slum back then. Um, but it was a gallery, and nevertheless, and artists such as Claire Zeisler and others uh, exhibited with him from time to time. Um, you can see Yoakum standing, and this is the, the photograph that was cropped for an article that you see below the poster, uh, which you can read in this slide. This was an article in the Chicago Daily News panorama section written by Norman Mark, a reporter who um, actually ended up being a, a TV reporter, but was at the time reported on the arts for the Daily News. And it was a very extensive interview with Mr. Yoakum in which he characterizes life 
um, in a way that he never wavered from, insisting that he was born on an Indian reservation in Arizona, that he was um, a Nava Joe, not Navajo Indian, 100%, um, and that he started drawing uh, when he did based on the force of a dream in which God told him to draw. And uh, when asked if he had seen all the places that uh, he depicted and was he actually drawing them uh, from memory, he said, actually, uh, I make the drawing, I have a spiritual unfoldment, and then I know where it is and I label it. So he inscribed all of his drawings with very particular locations. Um, many years ago, uh, when I started really studying him, I worked with an intern in our department to um, investigate every single title that we had and found that all of them were right. Um, sometimes they were, sometimes they were um, phonetically spelled. Um, the more complex titles and more, more complex locations were usually right, and we assumed that it's because he used an atlas for reference. Um, for many years, I would ask artists who knew him what kinds of things he kept for reference in his studio, wondering if, in fact, he had uh, National Geographics or picture books from which he made images or studied images to make his drawings. And no one ever remembered anything except his Bible and an atlas. And then um, as I was walking through the Chicago exhibition, what I saw with Lori Worsom, Carl Worsom's uh, widow, she turned to me at one point and said, did Carl ever mention all the National Geographics Joseph had stacked behind his drawing table? <laughs> this is how it goes, um, unfortunately. Um, apparently, Tom Brand claims that he told Whitney Halstead about these drawings. Uh, Whitney's not alive, I couldn't ask him. None of the artists who were close to Whitney remember Tom saying that. It's hard to know who's telling the truth. Tom has created a Wikipedia page for Joseph Yoakum, um, which is very, very full and rich, um, but also takes credit for spreading the word. Um, when I asked a few of the artists who got very close to Mr. Yoakum and uh, uh, really patronized him and helped him move his art out, out into the world, um, they all said that they never knew that Tom, that Whitney didn't really know Tom, it's not possible. It doesn't matter. Um, he told Sherbane, Sherbane approached Yoakum, gave him the exhibition, and that is where artists started finding his work. Carl Worsom, most likely. Um, Jim Nutt saw Yoakum's drawings in Carl's apartment. This is a early 70s picture of Carl's apartment, Carl and Lori's apartment. You can see, well, you can't see, I'll, I'll point. Which is funny because when I asked Carl about how many drawings he had before I actually saw the drawings that he had, he said, oh, we just have one. And uh, Jim Nutt asked him, why'd you only get one? How could you only get one? How could you only get one? And he said, I wanted to save some for other people. <laughs> Carl's very generous. Anyway, this, uh, this image of his apartment, his and Lori's apartment, is actually from a little book that Whitney Halstead made for the Worsoms on the eve of their departure for Sacramento, California, where they were invited to come. And Jim and Gladys were, were there. Jim Nutt and Gladys Nilsson were there teaching already, and they invited Carl to come and teach. And so this was a souvenir. And um, it's the only evidence I could find of what Jim may have seen when he saw Yoakum's drawings for the first time, which drove him absolutely crazy with glee. On the right, um, you see the original or copies of the original receipts for Jim's first acquisitions. Um, on April 25th, he bought eight drawings, thought about it, decided there wasn't enough, and went back the next day and bought four more. So from a very early moment, um, Jim Nutt was a huge fan, celebrant, and encourager of Mr. Yoakum, um, and went on to collect um, way too many drawings for me to tell you how many they have but there are fewer than what the Art Institute has because Whitney collected more. Here you see two of the drawings that Jim acquired. I think that it's important to point out that um, as we're talking about, I think artists' ability to tell their story the way they want to tell it and also their ability to move into the world in the way that they want to, want to move is that um, Jim and Gladys, Christina Ramberg and Phil Hansen, Carl and Lori Worsom, Roger Brown, these artists bought a lot of drawings from him and they never sold them. Um, they still had them until what I saw when Jim and Gladys decided that it was time to share what they had with the museums that organized the exhibition as a way of saying thanks for doing it because um, it was long overdue. 
and I'm the first to admit it, uh, somebody who has worked at the Art Institute for too many years to mention. When the show happened at Sherbane Gallery in 1968, and the younger artists started going to the gallery and buying drawings, and of course they were students, most of them, or just graduated students. Roger Brown, uh, Phil Hansen, and Christina Ramberg were just getting their BFA degrees in 1968. Um, Worsom, Nutt, Nilsson, and others um, had had their Harry Who shows by that time, two of them, and so they were long out of school, and all of them had, were fully formed. So when, they, when people would say, oh, they exploited Joseph Yoakum, and they stole his ideas, and they were really influenced by him, they were only influenced by Yoakum in the sense that, um, I'll get to that in a minute uh, more forcefully, that he was this person who just was making work. And it was highly personal, idiosyncratic, um, and it was poetic, and it was gut-wrenching, and he just did it. He didn't have anybody helping him do it. He just did it himself. He needed to do it. He had to do it. Um, and they, they, they felt a total kinship with him, except that he just appeared to them sort of suddenly and out of nowhere, um, without any kind of gallery track record. So the artists, Roger Brown notably, um, decided that they could look his, him up in the phone book to see if they could find him. And they did. He, Roger called Yoakum, asked, introduced himself, asked if he and some of his friends could come visit Mr. Yoakum. And he said, yes, please. And they did. And they started this tendency to go visit, buy drawings, um, enjoy Yoakum for a short period of time, and then leave. And this went on um, pretty much for the remainder of Yoakum's life for the people who stayed in Chicago. Uh, when Ed Sherbain found out that Yoakum was entertaining artists in his studio and selling directly out of his studio, likely for a fraction of what Sherbain was charging for the work, um, he called Yoakum and tried to get him to stop. Because what Joseph Yoakum didn't know is that when he signed a contract with, with Ed Sherbain to show the work, um, not understanding the way the art world worked, he signed an exclusive contract so that he had uh, agreed to only let Sherbain be his agent, which um, pissed him off, and he decided that he didn't need to do that. He didn't know what to do, and so Whitney Halstead, who by this time had taken on Yoakum as um, a tremendous artist um, living in their midst and someone he wanted to work on uh, very deeply, um, went to a law firm, Scott Hodes's law firm in Chicago, which specializes in intellectual property, and asked if they would write a letter to Ed Sherbain um, requesting that he vacate the contract. Sherbain just ignored them because he had a bona fide contract. And the only way that Yoakum could excuse himself from this relationship was to simply walk away. And in doing so, he left 200 drawings with Sherbain that he never got a cent for. That ended his relationship in 1968 with commercial galleries, and he didn't have a commercial gallery for the rest of his short life thereafter. Um, I'm going to show you some letters, and I'm going to leave them up for a, a bit so you can read some of them. I think it's important to point out that the artists across the board really loved Yoakum. Um, they saw him as somebody that they looked up to. They saw him as um, a, a gentle friend. They were fascinated by his story. I think that they recognized um, fairly early on that the Navajo thing was a, was a joke on his name and that they understood that he, there was no way that he was a Navajo Indian, even though he professed that he was, and that he, was an, he, or, he helped organize the American Indian Study Center in Chicago, but they kicked him out because they didn't like the color of his skin, but they wanted his drawings. I mean, he, did, he told a lot of tales, and I suppose in a way this was the way that he controlled his message. And I think that they all um, heard it, and they took it for what it was worth, um, and they, they kept returning because the force of his creativity was so powerful that um, they had to live with it. They had to have it. And most of them didn't really hang very many of them in, in their homes, which is one of the reasons why, for anybody who saw the, the recent Art Institute, MoMA, and Manila exhibition, they're so beautiful because they were basically in the condition that they were bought from his studio in because they hadn't been shown. Um, a few of them, Roger Brown, You'll get to that in a second. Roger Brown do, did show his all the time. And um, fortunately, they're not shown that way anymore um, because I insisted that they give them a rest every now and then for their own preservation. I want to um, encourage you to read, if you haven't, some of this wonderful 
section of Christina Ramberg's diaries. Christina Ramberg kept incredible diaries, and um, this is a transcription of one of them that she made for Whitney for his book that he was trying to write in the 1970s. Um, and one of the things that was really significant about a page that I'm not showing you is that Christina, um, in talking with Yoakum, Yoakum was talking about places he was going to visit, places that he had visited. She asked him if he had ever been to Alexandria, Virginia, which is where she was, where her parents, parents lived. And he said, and I quote, girl, I tell you, there's few places I haven't been of any size, that is, and there's nothing I haven't suffered to see things firsthand. So he insisted. Um, and uh, he also insisted that he had been every, on every continent but Antarctica, but it didn't prevent him from making a drawing of Antarctica, <laughs> which I love. Um, I think also reading this letter, you really get a sense of their kind of friendly banter back and forth. I mean, they would call him. If he didn't hear from them, he would call them. And particularly when um, they, they began helping him, particularly Jim in Sacramento, Ray Yoshida in Chicago, and Whitney Halstead, um, outside of Chicago, started helping Yoakum have his work exhibited um, outside of the Chicago tiny uh, art scene. Um, he started asking them to be agents for him, and none of them wanted to be his agent. Um, I asked, uh, this is a, a term that Jim not particularly hates. He was not his dealer, he was not his agent. He was trying to figure out how to be an artist in the commercial world himself. He didn't have enough time to be somebody else's agent, however. Um, he did have the capacity to encourage Yoakum to send work out to him in Sacramento because he had become friendly with uh, the owner of a gallery in Folsom called the Candy Store. And the owner of that gallery um, encouraged Jim and Gladys to tell her when they found something interesting. And so she started showing Yoakum's drawings. She started selling Yoakum's drawings. And when she would get a check uh, ready to, to give to him, she would send it to Jim and Jim would send it to Mr. Yoakum to his post office box because he didn't like getting mail at home, worried that, probably rightfully, um, he would be molested and, and robbed. Um, this is a momentous picture from November 29th, 1969, when um, Roger picked up Phil and Christina, uh, met Whitney Halstead at Maxwell Street Market, uh, which is uh, on the Chicago's near south side, it had been an open flea market that had long been a rag pickers area for Jewish merchants, but became a kind of place where you went to buy stuff, uh, objects dart, stuff that had been stolen from your apartment that you were looking for on the street, and so forth. And so they would meet there, there would be blues musicians playing outside, it was quite a scene on Sunday morning. And they, from there, they would go, typically, to go visit Mr. Yoakum by prior arrangement. And they met Carl Worsom and uh, Lori Gunn there as well. So that's Lori on the left, Carl holding his daughter Ruby, his infant daughter Ruby, Roger Brown, Mr. Yoakum, with a very freshly cut check in his pocket, um, <laughs> Phil Hansen and Christina Ramberg, uh, posing for Whitney Halstead. The first picture I showed you of Mr. Yoakum uh, close up, that was from the same moment. Whitney asked him if he could take his picture, and Yoakum replied, I knew I'd get shot eventually. <laughs> As you may have read in that diary page, um, Yoakum instigated contact with them as much as they did with him. And um, this visit, on this visit, uh, they didn't all buy drawings. Uh, there's a portion of the, of the diary in which Christina talks about how they wanted to buy this flower volcano from Honolulu, Hawaii. And it was the original, it was the, the line drawing on, on soft paper that Mr. Yoakum had made, and he didn't want to sell it because he didn't like selling his, what he called his, his originals. Um, he would often staple that sheet to another sheet with carbon paper in between and make a tracing, color the tracing, and then sell that and keep the original for himself. Part of that was because um, he was afraid of his patterns would be stolen, uh, as he called them. Um, part of it was that uh, he was suspicious, I think. I think artists, of course, go for the raw thing. They want that first, mo that first mark on the paper and the black and white or blue and white or blue and manila envelope, blue, blue ballpoint pen on manila paper drawings um, are in many ways really majestic. They don't have color to interrupt the invention. Uh, that, that Yoakum came up with graphically. And they were all interested in that graphic invention um, more so than anything else, even though many of them did comment on his very powerful and un unexpected color combinations. Um, 
a few more letters that sort of go into uh, the relationship that these people had. On the left, a very funny letter uh, from Ray Yoshida to Jim Nutt uh, from 1969. You can see Ray using um, pictures uh, to describe people. The Yoakums, it's, a, it's an egg yolk um. He's talking about Yoakum drawings. Let's see if I can get this to work. Well, anyway, I hope your butts aren't too sore. And then I think it's better to, to roll than package flat. So he's talking about sending packages out to, uh, to Jim so he can take them to Adeliza at the candy store. And um, this happened on a regular basis. Um, I also like the hand sons and brown on the next, on the next sentence. <laughs> Ray was a very, very funny guy. Um, on the right, a letter from Mr. Yoakum to Jim. And it is, you can see that he's still insisting that he was born in Window Rock, Arizona in 1888, uh, the wrong date. But that he's also insisting that when Jim presents him, he hopes that he is presenting him as a Navajo, not Navajo, because he's afraid that if he's known as that Negro Joseph Yoakum, his words, that he will be prejudiced against and that he will receive less prejudice, ironically, if he is considered to be a Native American. So it didn't really matter back then, of course, um, and probably to this day it doesn't matter. Uh, all, part, all of those parties are still being prejudiced against. Um, we are living in it constantly. But back then it was extremely uh, powerful, particularly for Mr. Yoakum, who had already you know, forfeited 200 drawings to a white dealer um, who would not allow him to live and, and live his life as an artist the way that he wanted to. Um, another example of Jim's reverence, this is a poster on the left uh, that he drew for a show that he organized for the candy store. Three famous artists, <laughs> pretty funny, with Jim and Gladys in uh, silhouette left and right and Mr. Yoakum right at the middle, <laughs> depicted as a real living person rather than a silhouette. So um, I think that's, that's Jim's way of, of honoring him. And um, on the right, um, another letter in which Yoakum is really hoping for more sales. Um, please uh, let me know. I really want, I want you to help me. Um, and I will offer you 30% commission. Uh, Jim and Ray would never accept commissions. Um, what they did instead was accept a reduction in the price of the drawings. So Mr. Yoakum discounted drawings for them. And uh, I asked if he remembered how much he spent on them, and he couldn't, but we have records of everything. And I think early on, um, the drawings that were sold at the whole were probably selling for five, 10, $15. Um, Ed Sherbain had prices of 25, 45, and $80 for the drawings, of which you know, he would take at least 50%, and he would charge slightly more if they were framed, so because he had to charge for the frame. And so Yoakum netted money from that. Um, Thereafter, Yoakum always insisted when he sent drawings anywhere that there'd be a contract. He had to have a contract with the numbers written down, everything clear, and it drove everybody crazy because they were just trying to help him and they were busy with their own stuff and they didn't want to have, no artist is a bookkeeper, um, which is why most artists fail at business because they don't have a bookkeeper or they don't keep books. And he certainly, they certainly didn't want to do it for Mr. Yoakum, but he wanted that as part of it, as part of the deal. So um, it's not like they were forcing him. They were just there to help. Um, later, in an interview in the mid-70s in Current Magazine, published in California, the great San Francisco art historian and curator Phil Linhares was interviewing Jim Nutt, um, who was just coming to the end of his time in Sacramento. And he asked him about Joseph Yoakum and what his takeaway from Joseph Yoakum was. This, this statement has been paraphrased, been paraphrased many times in the past, but I want to read it to you because it becomes very clear um, the way in which Yoakum affected Jim. We met Yoakum after Whitney Halstead and Ray Yoshida and the others made contact with him and began to visit him periodically. Because no, notice that they were in California when the visit started, so they weren't part of that. Gladys and I met him in 1969 when they were back visiting and saw a lot of his work. Whatever illusions I had about the necessities of being able to talk about my work and still be a good artist were, well, I found out it wasn't necessary because the things he had to say about his work illuminated a great deal about him. Like talking with anybody can tell you if they're nice or not, but you don't get the same meaning you do out of reading about an artist in an art book. 
and his being equally enthusiastic about his ceramic figurines and his drawings gave me reason to question some of my own enthusiasms. Don't you try to make sense out of everything? Try to make things logical? And that just makes it impossible, makes you believe in irony and other things as reality and not just as humorous satire. I can't verbalize about it. There's a word missing that would describe it for me. With Yoakum, that's the way it is, not in terms of making sense. And that's what he's like. Yoakum's work for me is fantastic, true fantasy. And when I came to learn that I had the right to my own, when I realized that I was willing to accept his. So in many ways, I would say that the relationship that they had with Mr. Yoakum made all of them grow up in a certain way um, because he was articulating a thing that was inarticulable. It was, you, it was, you couldn't. It was just a, it was a total story. And um, they wanted that. They wanted to experience that. Um, this image of uh, Whitney Halstead on the left, Mr. Yoakum in the middle, and Ray Yoshida on the right was in someone's backyard, probably also 1969. Um, the visits, I think, started dropping off when Yoakum got sick um, in 1971, and he was sick for a long time. And his drawing amounts uh, diminished after that as well. But at this point, um, it was the, probably the, the high point of their relationship when Whitney would bring Yoakum to the school, SAIC school store to buy supplies and they would walk through the museum together occasionally, and Yoakum was out and about with him. So it was very friendly and, and respectful. And he was referred to as Mr. Yoakum, not Joseph or Nava Joseph. Whitney and Ray introduced a man named Richard Frankel um, to Mr. Yoakum. Richard Frankel uh, was a student at U of C, a graduate of U of C. He became uh, a professor and director of the gallery at Penn State University. And in 1969, he was in Chicago and had the occasion to visit Mr. Yoakum with these two guys and was so blown away that he invited Yoakum to have a show at Penn State. And he laid out the terms, as you can see in the letter on the right, including an honorarium of $150. Um, Yoakum wasn't sure what that was and wasn't sure he should accept it because he couldn't figure out why. He thought it was some kind of trick. Um, and it had, he had to insist on it, and eventually he did take it. Um, here you see on the right the announcement card for the, drawing, for the drawings at Penn State, the world of Joseph Yoakum, not Penn State's own uh, naive artist, but just the drawings of, somewhat very early on recognizing that he was just an artist. And then you can see on the left Whitney Halstead's notes, um, and I have to s pause here for a second because none of this would be on the screen if it were not for the Archives of American Art, which I'm truly grateful for. Um, it's part of your institution here at the Smithsonian, and it's a remarkable um, uh, asset to, to everybody who's interested in studying. All of this stuff comes from Whitney Halstead's archive, including these little scrap, scrappy notes. The, my favorite part at the bottom of the second scrap on the, on the left, will success spoil Joseph Yoakum? Question mark. Wait and see. And I think that was prophetic, because um, after Whitney started taking the work to New York, Yoakum became more and more demanding and uh, made it very, very difficult because to pack and ship to a museum is very different from packing and shipping to a gallery. And in fact, I found out that Whitney was using the packing department at this museum. And I thought that would never happen today. But apparently you could just walk in with stuff that the museum didn't own and pack it and ship it. <laughs> I wish I had seen that. Like the look on people, you want to do what? <laughs> A couple more letters. Um, here, Yoakum is so thrilled by the ease with which Frankel is treating him and the fact that he pays him right away for the drawings that have been sold, and they sold quite a lot. Um, and then he asks him if he would you know, take his drawings to New York, and you can see towards the bottom, he's offering him 35% on the dollar for anything that he sells for him. And of course, Richard Frankel did not accept anything. None of these people ever accepted anything. Uh, MoMA took a percentage when they showed his work in their penthouse gallery. And they also, you'll see in a second, uh, charged Whitney for the framing, which then Whitney had to try to extract from Yoakum's um, net. And Yoakum didn't understand it, and so Whitney just let it go. But you see in the second letter on the right, at the top, he's outlining for Frankel the breakdown of what Sherbane took from him, and the value of it being almost $15,000. That's in 1968 terms. So that was a lot of Joseph Yoakum's valuable intellectual materials. And I don't think he ever really recovered his trust for a commercial um, negotiant after that, and you can imagine why. 
And it wasn't until he was in the nursing home that a lot of his work did end up selling to uh, commercial galleries, which is how they largely got out into the world later. Here you see Mr. Yoakum in his studio at his drawing table. This is a photograph taken by Roger Vail, who was another one of the artists who visited him and a, a really good photographer in his own right. I'm showing it to you because it's the curiosities behind him. These are the ceramic heads that Yoakum seemed to treat with equal measure to his drawings. And they were essentially cast from hobby store, you know, mugs that he then painted. What he had originally had wanted to do in his storefront was to have a ceramic studio, but the city wouldn't issue him a license. So he ended up making drawings because as he put it to one of the artists, if I didn't do something, I would go crazy. So he drew. Later, um, Whitney arranged for him to have a show at the School of the Art Institute's Wabash Street Gallery um, with the artist Pauline Simon, who is a, a Chicago, uh, ever-present Chicago artist who also didn't have academic training, but whose portraits, as you see on the left in this one, were revered by the community. If anybody wants to see this, better. I brought it with me. You can see it later. I also brought um, this so you could see this later and understand how it was constructed. This is the Shurbain poster with the Norman Mark article printed on the back. That's handleable by whoever wants to. Um, in the letter on the left, you can see that Whitney's talking about um, the, the show at the Wabash Transit Gallery traveling to Rockford College, where their friend Phil Diedrich, another SAIC graduate, hosted, hosted the show and then hosted Yoakum and invited him to come and lecture, took him out to dinner, et cetera, et cetera. So Yoakum was really welcome and invited into the Chicago artist community, um, the artist community, not the gallery community. The gallery community was quite small. Um, it's hard to imagine how small the, the, the art world was in the 60s, but it was tiny. And, um, and so people knew each other, and this sort of embrace of Yoakum was able to happen, I think in part, because the, um, the, man, the manner of communication between people was so intimate. And it was not hard to go and visit. And he welcomed people into the studio, as I said. Um, this letter, this hilarious letter from Whitney to the, the nuts out in California, you can see he keeps repeating, this is a letter, this is a letter, this is a letter. I think Jim didn't write back very often. And so Whitney was like dying for, dying for some help, just, just some words. And I think that you can see that um, he's referring to Joseph E. is still doing some, some good things, although he has been in the hospital. I received a letter from MoMA wanting some of his drawings, had seen Cynthia Carlson's another Chicago artist who, who migrated to New York, spent a week trying to get a hold of him, blah, 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 blah. And so indeed, drawings were sent to the penthouse at Museum of Modern Art, where Yoakum showed with Mel Bachner and a few other big art world names in the penthouse. And the work was acquired by curators, but didn't enter the Museum of Modern Arts collection. Another letter from Whitney to the Nuts, where he starts, Dear Delinquents. Um, <laughs> He, here he's talking about his experience with the Whitney Museum. At this point, Marsha Tucker, who is a young curator at the Whitney, um, had visited them in California, probably at Phil Linhare's in, uh, invitation, and was considering their work for the Whitney Biennale. Um, Gladys had had a one-person show at the Whitney, one of the first women to have a solo show there, a living artist having a show at the Whitney in the early 70s. And while they were out there, um, I'm sure that they, she saw the Yoakums and wanted to see them, in fact. Um, she then visited him in Chicago very briefly and then engaged Whitney Halstead to organize an exhibition for the Whitney of the drawings. And Whitney ended up doing the whole thing. And you can see in this letter he talks about how um, Marsha's visit with Yoakum was by phone and actually her secretary's by phone, uh, which as we all know is the way that happens sometimes for curators who are busy when they have a side project that isn't really their project, but they're willing to let somebody else do the project. They will take partial credit for it, but they let the other person do the, do the project. So here's Whitney with Marsha in the exhibition. And Whitney's, one of Whitney's two slides that he shot of the exhibition, the Whitney Museum didn't have any pictures of the exhibition in their archives. And Marsha is holding the gallery sheet, the gallery brochure that Whitney also wrote. Um, in that previous letter, I think it's clear that he, um, he was charged for somebody else's shipping. And, and, and the Whitney, uh, Registrar's office said you had agreed to pay for this. And so he's taken, uh, he's very insulted by the fact that not only did he organize the show, get all the loans, do the writing, 
help with the installation all for nothing. He, didn't, he wasn't paid for it. They had the audacity to charge him also. Getting towards the end here, um, a picture of Joachim in the nursing home where he died with one of his workbooks. This is the Weeping Pebble drawing, which became part of the exhibition. We opened to that page because Esther Adler singularly loved the Weeping Pebbles, and I can't say that I blame her. Um, the inspiration for this exhibition was this muckraking article published in G December 1972 by the Chicago Tribune and written by Jane Adams and um, Derek Guthrie, who were the originators of the New Art Examiner. They hated the Harry Who, they hated the so-called imagists. Um, they felt like they were some kind of conspiracy holding all artists in Chicago back, which wasn't true. And they went to visit Yoakum as he was dying and was probably fantasizing and got him to say some things which you know, were not true. And we all know that people when they're not all there say things that aren't true, but they imagine them. And then the Tribune published it, despite the fact that the artist had written them a letter saying, this is garbage, it doesn't reflect our interviews with them. And essentially, the title, Portrait of the Artist as a Luckless Old Man, in the end, the writers exploited Yoakum in his failing health um, more so than the artists they accused of exploiting him at, at, at all. Um, so it's a, it's a galling article, um, and I'm showing it to you because I think we all need to remember that um, journalism is not always objective. Um, well, it's not. <laughs> and I want to... Uh, come to the close here by showing you a picture of Pablo Picasso holding paintings by Henri Rousseau that he owned. Um, Picasso and Braque and Eric Satie and other intellectuals in Paris, when they discovered Rousseau's work, treated him with great respect and organized dinners for him. Uh, when I met with Roger in 1995 and interviewed him in this room of his Yoakums with him sitting on the couch, um, I said, what, what was Joachim to you? And he said, for Chicago, he was Chicago's douanier, Rousseau. And they, he felt, and they felt the same way that Picasso and his peers did about Rousseau, that here's this person just came out of nowhere making these fantastic paintings with a very strong point of view, period. Um, and they respected that. And then finally, um, the cover of our book, which I so love, is a detail of this Grizzly Gulch uh, Vermont drawing that Ray Yoshida owned. And digging around, we found that there was an artist in Chicago in the 70s who was documenting Chicago artist studios. And this was how Ray used to display his yokums on a music stand in his kitchen. And uh, it's just so incredibly intimate and charming. And it says everything there is to know about this amazing symbiotic relationship that occurred um, in Chicago in a moment in time that I wish I had been there for. Thank you very much, and I want to welcome. Thank you. I want to welcome Lisa to the stage. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Leslie for inviting me to speak today. Um, I was an intern here many years ago, and I worked on the Herbert Hemphill collection and did research for the Made with Passion catalog. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to return to be part of the symposium and to celebrate another significant gift um, from the Robeson family of self-taught art to the museum's collection. The artist Henry Darger created an astounding and unprecedented body of work, not despite of, but because of the difficulties and tragedies of his life. His world-building project was a safe space for him to take control over his immediate environment and to express his experiences and process the world around him. He grew up in Chicago and lived in unremitting poverty. His childhood included a series of hardships and misfortunes that began when he was age four, when his mother died during childbirth. Darger's family immediately gave up the newborn sister for adoption. At age eight, Darger experienced the loss of his father's presence in his life. 
shortly after he was sent to the Mission of Our Lady of Mercy Boys Home. Bouncing around from parochial schools to Catholic boys' homes, and at age 13, entering the Lincoln Asylum for Feeble-Minded Children for Self-Abuse, Darger lived most of his adolescent years in institutions. His lack of social skills and non-conformative behavior tested the resolve of many educators, clergy, and physicians. Beginning around age 16 and after hearing of his father's death, Darger attempted three escapes from the asylum. On the third attempt in 1909, he succeeded and walked back to Chicago from central Illinois. He lived the remainder of his life quietly, working in Catholic-run hospitals as a janitor, a dishwasher, and in his late years as general help in kitchens and stock rooms. Attended Catholic math, mass daily, sometimes thrice, Darger jokingly called himself a sorry saint. Darger never married or had children. However, children, specifically little girls, are everywhere in his art. His girls have a peculiar charm. We are taken in by their wide-eyed faces, corkscrew curls, and mesmerizing polka dots upon polka dots. Their bodies intertwine with flowers in a kind of collective effervescence. The delight and amusement we feel is also met with discomfort when viewing the torture and brutal carnage of their bodies. Furthermore, we may feel perplexed by their queer gender variants as the artist disrobes their bodies and identifies these characters as, quote, little girls. Henry Darger called his fantasy world the realms of the unreal. It's a magical place full of beauty and violence. It draws and sustains our attention. It delivers many unanswered questions. In the spirit of today's symposium, I'd like to embrace the theme of stories, specifically those narratives embedded within and intersecting throughout Darger's fantastic and curious little girl motif. Previous scholars, scholarship view this element in Darger's art in various ways. One as a manifestation of his sexual identity or an outlet for his own queer feelings and experiences. Two, as a sign of a traumatic, possibly abused childhood. And three, as so-called evidence of the artist's confusion about societal norms governing polarities of male and female bodies. I like to depart from these interpretations that rely heavily on autobiographic or psychobiographic frameworks. Instead, my approach takes a less direct and more meandering path through an examination of Darger's resource materials and their cultural context. I offer a new way of understanding the little girl motif as an amalgam of redemptive and gender-bending figures from American popular culture and Catholic lore who were familiar to the artist. Scholars estimate that Darger spent 20 years, approximately 20 years, writing in the realms of the unreal and nearly five decades creating artworks referencing its story. Three bound volumes of visual artwork accompanied the written in the realms of the unreal with around 120 double-sided watercolor drawings of various sizes, some unfolding up to 12 feet in length. The fictional narrative of his opus describes holy wars between practitioners of child slavery, the satanic nation of Glandolinia, and the abolitionist Catholic kingdoms united under Abiennia. In this mythic saga, seven young Abiennian princesses, known as the Vivian Girls, become the catalyst for insurrection and subsequent liberation of millions of indigenous child slaves. The members of this plucky band of sisters are Violet, age nine and a half, Joyce, 10, Jenny, 10, Evangeline, sometimes spelled as Angeline, age nine, Daisy, seven, Hetty, eight, and Catherine, age seven. The sisters have one parent, their father, Robert Vivian, the emperor of Angelinia. As a group, they lead the Christian troops in Darger's epic battle between good and evil. To dispel any doubt, Darger explains why girls are braver than boys in his story. 
And he says, as you can scroll down here, the reason the story runs so much with little girls as the actual heroes in this warfare is because under most circumstances, women are braver than men. And he says, I go on to show that little girls do and are brave enough to take part in active warfare. Later down, he asks, how about the play known as The Little Rebel? Was not she braver than the soldiers in the play? Here in this introductory passage, Darger draws upon a spunky and pious character, The Little Rebel, as an example of girlish fortitude. This heroine of Ever Pepple's 1911 play achieved widespread popularity through Shirley Temple's portrayal in the major Hollywood production, The Littlest Rebel, in 1935. Negotiating the trials of the Civil War, this Confederate belle epitomizes religious piety and wholesomeness. Forced into a position of autonomy, motherless and temporarily orphaned by the imprisonment of her father, the six-year-old Miss Virgie takes matters into her own hands. In the movie's climax, she appeals to Abraham Lincoln and negotiates the re release of her father. Temple was a face of childhood while Darger penned and visualized his story. According to Time Magazine, Temple at age eight was the world's most photographed person, appearing in newspapers and celebrity magazines daily. Her films consistently broke box office revenue records from 1935 to 38, catapulting her star quality beyond that of any actress, peers, child, or adult. Temple's on-screen characters frequently play the role of an almost orphan who reforms adults with her naive, big-hearted optimism. Due to some tragedy or circumstance, Temple finds herself without a mother, but secures one in a maternalized father figure. She emerges in her films as the lead actress, taking charge of men around her, often wooing them as she sits on their laps. Through her disarming charm, and cute coquetry, Temple transforms cantankerous widows or morally dubious bachelors. Consequently, she restores broken adult relationships. And as scholar John Casson argues, she was a catalyst for, quote, the repair of the sentimental economy of men during the Great Depression. America's love affair was not lost on Darger. Several items found in Darger's apartment confirm his share of society's infatuation with this child star. These items include a reproduction of a photograph around 1936 of Shirley Temple in a thoughtful pose, your friend Shirley Temple in printed script below. There's also a penciled in handwritten address, which you can't see here, that says to Lorraine Witts that indicates that this may have been a stock image for a fan club member that Darger rescued from the trash. A large hole at the image's top center infers that Darger may have hung the stock photograph up on his wall. In addition to this image, uh, he also owned a few of um, books that featured Shirley Temple, including one of popular children's stories, as well as two biographical texts. The allure and power of littleness, or the diminutive, is referenced in Darger's insistence on calling his protagonist little girls, as well as his primary example of bravery, the little rebel. Little also refers to the age group of the Vivians, age seven through 10, and their fashions, a pinafore-style dress trimmed in bows with thigh-high hemlines, influenced by Shirley Temple's attire in her commercialized fashion line. Little characters are also found in his collection of children's literature. These characters exemplify standards of virtue and fortitude and include, among many others, Little Eva from Uncle Tom's Cabin, Little Nell from Dickens' The Old Curiosity Shop, and Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. However, it is in his visual work that we find one of the most influential little models, the little flower of Christ. Saint Therese of Lisieux, the self-proclaimed little flower of Christ, is widely known by Catholics. Canonized in 1925, this French Carmelite saint was adored due, her, due to her girlish innocence 
and humble inspirations that she entitled The Little Way and published in 1925. St. Therese's call to figuratively stay unassuming and humble like little children resonates throughout her writings as a metaphor for loving Jesus. And this is just one example from her, um, her journal called The Little Way. And there's some slight variation in the color of the text, but I've highlighted here uh, basically that even though we have the splendor of the rose and the whiteness of, of the lily, they do not take away the perfume of the little violet or the delightful simplicity of the daisy. Um, and then later she says that he, as in God, has created smaller ones and these must be content to be daisies and violets. Um, it's important to note here that two of the seven Vivian girls have floral names and they are Violet Vivian and Daisy Vivian, the very humble flowers that St. Therese celebrates in her journals. The little flower of Christ floral metaphors urge one to remain little or childlike in order to please Christ and retain immunity from adult corruptive forces. Dying in a convent at the young age of 22, St. Therese's whole, uh, short and holy life represents what she espoused. An eternal spirit of girlhood describing dogmatic concepts in simple, childish terms of sunshine, blooming flowers, and smiling Madonnas. Darger's awareness of the little flower is evident in his retention of two newsletters from the Society of the Little Flower, headquartered in Chicago, one published in 1932 and another in 1959 a holy card of the saint, and two letters from Catholic charities devoted to her. More importantly, he demonstrates an understanding of the little flower's message and exemplar role by including St. Teresa's image in After the Battle of Drosabella, After Mr. Werther Run, and At Angeline Agatha, a tripartite work in which I'm showing the last segment here. Therese's holy card image frames the upper left corner of Darger's composition, fortifying a little way subtext with its companion piece, A Holy Card of Christ. Reading clearly as a conventional heart of Jesus motif, Christ opens his tunic to reveal a flaming and thorn-bound heart radiating light. Residing over the Vivian story unfolding before and beneath them, this powerful backdrop underscores the message of little girl virtue within the composition's full caption. At Angeline Agatha, Jenny in vain offers her sight lost in an accident for the conversion of John Manley, her worst enemy. Instead, her sight suddenly came back. Offering up her ability to see for the good of the Christian cause, Jenny Vivian performs an act in accordance with those of confessor saints like St. Therese, desiring to give of herself in order to cleanse the sins of others. The Little Flower's inclusion in this work lends for followers of Catholic faith a support structure of Christian virtue, self-sacrifice, and hope. St. Therese's presence contextualizes the Vivians within the little way of girl sainthood and her exaltation of childhood as a redemptive force. These two little girl models embrace varying notions of piety and goodness and selflessness and sacrifice. Moreover, their actions, social roles, and outward appearance confirm gender binary norms. So what are we to think about Darger's disrobed girl who disrupts these norms? Let's start with how he created her. Darger gleaned his little girl imagery from popular culture, things like girls found in coloring books, advertisements, and comic strips. These sources represent nostalgic fantasies of an idyllic youth, while also reinforcing binary codes of gender. Girls bake cookies and wear the latest fashions, boys ride bikes and play with slingshots. For someone like Darger, a self-proclaimed protector of children, attuned to the call of these images, his resources offer a rich, fertile wellspring for illustrating his tale. The depicted children appear happy and healthy, and as evidenced by their clothing and situations, bear markers affili affiliated with white, middle-class America. 
The homogenous population of his resources provides multiple vicarious ways for Darger to feed a desire to possess and perpetuate the look and feel of a childish utopia that he never personally experienced during his own childhood. Unsure of his ability to draw, he rendered form through copying and tracing, using watercolor and temper paint to enliven his imagery, while occasionally adding collage elements and small freehand penciled in additions. Comparison of an original image of a girl from the Sears Roebuck catalog with Darger's trace variation illustrates the way in which he extruded what he sometimes called nuded girls. This example, a girl in a short jumper and roller skates, translates onto carbon paper as a nearly nude girl wearing only socks and shoes. She exhibits non-binary characteristics. Darger pulls a pencil along the silhouette of her diminutive figure, imagining her form beneath the folds of cloth. Schematic genitalia referencing natal sex organs assigned as male complete her open-legged active pose. The act of tracing allowed Darger to unlock Vivian girlhood secrets that are latent in images from popular culture. Drawing her form instigates a literal exposure, a frank revealing of the openness and ambiguous potential of girl bodies. Likewise, tracing the girl's forms allowed the artist to transform still bodies into moving ones by extending legs, enlarging eyes, and opening mouths. What Dugger appropriated from his resources was a remarkably vacant and pliable image right for reinvention and control. A few carefully traced lines along with minimal improvisation magically turned a copper tone girl or a coloring book lass into a fantastic blengen, a composite girl figure with butterfly wings and curled ram's horns. Likewise, little girls with extending legs could be modified with penciled in genitalia, a motif that I call the little girl on the run, after John Ashbery's poem, but more so based upon a phrase that Darger scribbled onto an enlargement envelope that read, quote, little girl on the run, maybe draw a massacre picture, end quote. After examining over 300 artworks and studies, of which 85 feature this motif, I've come to the conclusion that the little girl on the run is a significant and meaningful element in Darger's visual work. This girl appears in situations where they are in peril, most often tense situations involving fight or flight responses. Captions where the little girl on the run appear include words like rescue, escape, outwit, pursue, capture, trap, approaching storm and battle, and in the Robeson gift we also find attacked and ambushed. However, this motif reads as more than just an image of fight or flight. Rather, she lingers in Darger's drawings as a mercurial emblem of spiritual mobility, playfulness, and social transgression. With only a few simple pencil marks, Darger fabricates a complex and perplexing fantastic child, a queer figure of motility and fluid mutability. Curiously, the artist does not explain or even mention the fluidity of little girl bodies in his voluminous, detailed narrative or in his captions for visual works. His prose instead insists upon the beauty, purity, and wholesome integrity of the Seven Vivians and the thousands of little girls populating his tale. Consider, for example, this belabored passage in which Darger describes his ultimate girl crusaders. He writes, whatever else was beautiful or dainty or delightful faded to nothingness when contrasted with the bewitching faces of the Vivian girls. And it has often been said by those who know that no other ruler in all the world, nor any children, boys or girls, or even women, could ever hope to equal, or ever will equal, or even get anywhere near to it, the gracious charm of their manner, loveliness, and righteousness that equaled their features. More importantly, beyond allusions to their beauty, 
Darker refused to, refers to his girls in sacred terms as, quote, holy innocents or other Christ. The surname of his protagonist also infers their superior constitution. The etymology of Vivian stems from the prefix vivi, meaning to enliven or animate. In his art, the girls come to life, become vivid, perceptible, or real. Their passionate virtue and piety vivifies others, especially those fighting against evil. A deeper significance of Vivian lies in its Latin derivation, vivam, literally, I shall live. Evoking an inextinguishable vitality that characterizes the Vivian girl's demeanor and instinctual knack for survival. Vivam resembles a cry of resistance. Moreover, Vivam resounds with a message of Christian resurrection and redemption embodied by the Vivian girls in Darker Story. Furthermore, his imagery provides no indication that anatomical variance disrupts these aesthetic and moral traits or that little girl bodies rendered in any manner equate to corruption, sin, or vice. In any given scenario, Vivian's and other protagonists may reveal or not show signs of this variance. The physical qualities of the little girl on the run motif may well be a kind of metamorphosis or instantaneous change. And if so, these changes conform to the Vivian naturally without need for explanation or great spectacle in itself. Given the frequency of such transformative situations and the important role it plays in representing the sacred and redemptive girl body, one must assume that this fluid morphology signifies meaning, aligning with Vivian traits of purity and virtue. While Darger embraced his non-binary representation of childhood, ephemera collected and traced by the artists, such as coloring book imagery, clothing advertisements, and parents' magazine articles, signal that Darger was keenly aware of society's divisions between boys and girls and its determination of girlish, girlish femininity. He replicated the petticoats, the braided ponytails, and Mary Jane's shoes comprising attire for girls ages six through 12, and dressed the denizens of the realms of the unreal and the codes and conventions of the day that outwardly announced their age-appropriate girlishness. Conversely, Darger also collected images that appeared to reinforce similarity instead of variance in the bodies of children. These include a small, small portion of magazine and newspaper photographs featuring prepubescent, prepubescent children in the nude or partial dress. In this example, four children are strikingly similar in an uncaptioned newspaper photograph. Shirtless and in what appears to be white underwear, this foursome sits on a bench and quietly observes something or someone outside the picture. Due to their prepubescent age, their flat chests and lean forms offer a kind of uniformity. Only long and braided hair on three may signal a gendered difference. Another example reveals a charming narrative about a precocious child. Here we see little Debbie Compton, a shirtless three-year-old who gives the camera an impish smile as we learn she has been chasing fire trucks in the middle of the night and rescued by Detroit police who warm her up with hot chocolate. Her behavior is hardly ladylike. I love little Debbie Compton. Gender polarity within the, the, realms of, the written realms of the unreal stems mainly through hairstyle and hair length. Bouncy curls and flowing locks signify female. Short cropped hair signifies male. Passages in his narrative confirm this pattern. Here, Jenny disguises herself as a boy. A masquerade of male gender implicitly informs this passage. Dressed in boys' clothes, Jenny must now bob her hair to complete the, illus the illusion so she can sneak behind enemy lines. A few paragraphs later, Jenny and her compatriots discuss boyish mannerisms, and I must stamp and take long steps like a boy and look saucy. Acting and looking like a boy, Jenny sets out on her journey. 
We learn here that boys exhibit a vigorous gait and perhaps of consequence to Darger's depictions of lunging and running non-binary, excuse me, non-binary children take long steps. Darger expressed a cisgender vision of girlhood through clothes, hair length, and mannerisms, but queered that vision when girls were nuded and running or fighting. Darger's nuded girls denote a passive context indicating that somehow forces known or unknown strip girls of their clothing. Nuded happens, and as Darger's art attests, the girls do not mind, except of course, when fiery tongues of flame or glandolinian hands disrobe them. Girls frolic in fields, f battle foes, and run through the hills in various states of undress. Darger shows them foregoing gestures of modesty, expressing instead an edenic shamelessness and athletic prowess, comfortable and quite capable of multiple and dangerous tasks while nuded. By creating his own term for the girl's disrobed condition, Darker may be suggesting a third state, a queer position, betwixt and between boy and girl. Such liminality, a moment of escape from anatomical and socially con constructed boundaries, allows his protagonist to exist, however briefly, within a transgressive and possibly transcendent form. As we find in many scenarios that test the resolve of little girls, these non-binary slippages prove valuable, even necessary for saving the day. Throughout Darger's Realms of the Unreal, little girl bodies are transformed and empowered within an anatomical and gendered spectrum. They share this trait in common with female Catholic saints, especially those renowned for their virile nature and gender-bending appearance. Darger's Roman Catholic faith permeated every aspect of his life. He grew up in Catholic boys' homes, worked in Catholic hospitals, covered his apartment with crucifixes and chromolithographs and statuettes of saints in the Holy Family. He went to mass daily, often making multiple trips for novenas and feast days. Some elements of Catholic material culture remain obvious and identifiable in Darger's art. However, his visual reconceptual, reconception of a, a mutable, and as I argue, thus symbolically holy little girl presents us with a creation difficult to categorize, let alone pinpoint to a single devotional image. Turning to the wealth of fantastic stories within Catholic literature describing physical transformations, as well as belief structures blurring gender boundaries, provides us with a strong corollary to Darger's equally supernatural Vivian girl. By, quote, becoming male or performing maleness, Certain female saints rebuked social determinations of roles. According to theologian Margaret Miles, such male performances included practicing forms of asceticism, like maintenance of chastity and virginity or fasting, estranging from patriarchal figures and domesticity, changing bodily appearance, and exhibiting spiritual fortitude. Male hagiographers describe these so-called virile women as, quote, more like men than nature would seem to allow, end quote. Examples from this male genre include Thecla, a beautiful noblewoman who repudiates her engagement to retain her virginity, alienates her family, and follows the apostle Paul. Thecla cut her hair and wore men's clothes in order to travel freely and avoid rape. Pelagia masqueraded as a man and joined a monastery. Her gender was discovered only after her death. Saint Vilgefortis, a 10-year-old girl, was crucified by her father for mysteriously sprouting a beard overnight before her arranged marriage. Usually represented nailed to a cross, this bearded woman is often confused with a crucified Christ. Liminalities of gender and physiology not only thrive within these tales of Christian saints, but also inform ways in which Catholicism presents the power of the divine. Within the Catholic worldview, or what sociologist and priest Andrew Greeley describes as, quote, the Catholic imagination, the carnality of humanity offers the faithful a locus for engaging the divine. 
the Immaculate Conception, the Incarnation of Christ, and his resurrection, among other central tenets of the Catholic faith, rely upon the miraculous potential and malleability of the physical human body. Flesh becomes both the source for and the symbol of religious piety. In fact, historian Carolyn Walker Bynum posits that female saints and mystics exhibited the most corporeally theatrical constitutions with propensities for falling into trances and experiencing stigmata, levitation, and elongation or enlargements of parts of the body. As importantly, acts of agency by women fulfilled a notion of becoming male as a means to accentuate Christian identity. Embodiments of sacredness or piety meant blurring gender distinctions and thus exhibiting male qualities. As a central trope in the stories of Christian heroines, becoming male allowed women to transcend gender differences and access spiritual advancement. We find evidence of Darger's investment in these thoughts through his incorporation of the female saints dear to him, namely Joan of Arc and potentially Vivia Perpetua, whose name and unique morphology closely resembles that of the Vivians. Both legends of saints Perpetua and Joan of Arc serve as supreme exemplars in Miles's genre of becoming male. By the time Darger alludes to the Vivian's driving spirit as akin to that of the Maid of Orleans and inserts Joan of Arc's holy card into his imagery, Jean La Pucelle's legend has already reached the Catholic pinnacle of sainthood. Her image additionally reaches another elevation as a secular spokesperson for the US government's World War I effort. Scholars find that a Joan of Arc Vogue flourished in America between 1894 through 1929. Periodicals and theatrical productions capitalized on America's growing interest in this girl saint. Many equated St. Joan's attempts to drive the enemy from, France, from French soil with the patriotism of American soldiers in France during World War I. Specific feminine aspects of St. Joan's life manifest in her virginity and defense of her chastity. Her greatness, however, hinges upon extraordinary acts of bravery and a legendary body resistant to age and sexual differentiation. The legend of St. Joan of Arc asserts an incongruous virile femaleness ruled by an excessive spiritual conviction rivaling that of Christ. She transcends the limits of her gender while boldly asserting that fortitude and passion are not the exclusive properties of men. Like the Vivians who never age, Joan of Arc remained little throughout her short, intense life. Her saintly acts span a six-year six period from age 13 when she first heard voices until her death at the stake at age 19. Coupling the sustaining childhood with practices of transvestism on and off the battlefield, with extraordinary bravery, and with a lifestyle devoid of conventional gendered obligation, St. Joan's image swirls within a conundrum. She is female, but not considered quite a woman in social standing or a physiological maturity. She dons male clothing and exceeds spiritual passion, strength, and vigor, qualities associated with men. She embodies the innocence of a child as a holy virginal woman and a fortitude approaching that of Christ. Cultural historian Marina Warner eloquently describes Joan of Arc's image as, quote, sexlessness, the state of suspension, of non-differentiation achieved by a transvestite girl confirmed by the Christian tradition as holy, end quote. While Darger equates the Vivian's fortitude to St. Jones in his written story, her role as a contextual reference to Vivian girl bravery and sacrifice is even more emphatic at, at Zoe du Beck, result after Violet saves a priest and a sacred monstrance from being shot. In the left corner adjacent to a drawn sculpture of a crucified Christ, Darger includes a framed portrait of a kneeling and praying St. Joan. The simple composition, composition and St. Joan's clear circular halo suggests that Darger traced this image from a prayer card. Although Joan reportedly bobbed her dark hair, 
Historical representations of her in holy cards and fine art projected a feminine image with long golden or strawberry blonde hair. Her magnificent white horse lingers behind her, turning to witness St. Joan's raised arms and penitent face. In the far right corner, a blonde Vivian girl also falls to her knees and prays. Her gaze extends to the sacrificial pair of Christ and St. Joan. Next to this pra uh, praying girl lies Violet Vivian, recuperating from a gunshot wound. Violet has taken a bullet to save both the integrity of a monstrance containing the Holy Eucharist host and the life of a priest. In this visual alignment, Darger pulls a symbol symbolic thread, reading from left to right, Christ on the cross, St. Joan, and bleeding Violet. Violet, the leader of the Vivian girls in her altruistic act and suffering, resembles the pendant examples of Jesus and St. Joan. This narrative panel implying St. Joan calls the Vivians to perform virile transgressions of their gender. In this sense, St. Joan's example does more than contextualize Darger's little girls. St. Joan legitimizes their role as sacred gender benders. The Vivians and other girls in his story, like St. Joan, become active phallic females, blurring gender and commanding reverence. They wield a divine privileged body marked as a recipient of grace, free from sin, and free from social constraints. More, moreover, Darger's chosen family name for his seven protagonists follows a trajectory of vitality, endurance, and dispossession echoed within the name of female Saint Vivier Perpetua. Saint Perpetua holds the distinction of being one of seven women mentioned in the Eucharist prayer of Mass. Theologians view her passion as a seminal document that shaped conventions for female sacred biographies since early Christianity. Believed to be written in her own voice, her passion worked to transcend the vulnerability and social stigma of her body, identifying with heroic athleticism and spiritual integrity of maleness. She was a woman who rose above her station and as a mother who renounced motherhood and like her name, resoundingly declared and demonstrated her Christian identity. The life of Vivia Perpetua demanded nothing less than total surrender of mind and body to the Christian cause. Her progression from earthly concerns to otherworldly salvation begins with her conversion to Christianity and subsequent incarceration by the Romans in Carthage around 203 CE. Ignoring her father's pleas to renounce her beliefs and to resume her motherly duty with her pagan family, Perpetua prays for liberation from both. Divinity grants her petition by miraculously ceasing lactation and thus a physical link between her and her son. She additionally exhibits extreme resolve and volition by giving her son to her father. Unencumbered by family or male domination, Perpetua leaves behind markers of her femininity. She becomes an active religious agent, controlling her emotions and remaining firm to her faith, even as she faces her approaching death. The masculinizing narrative of her story reaches its apex in Perpetua's fourth and final dream, sanctified as a vision. The night before her martyrdom, she dreams of entering the amphitheater to compete against an Egyptian identified within her passion as the devil. Stripped by assistance in preparation for battle, Perpetua is awestruck by her transformation into a male muscular body. Her gaze drops to her genital region and she confirms her systemic manhood by uttering, I became a man. Perpetua achieved her martyrdom and thus her victory in the Colosseum. Gored by a heifer, she dramatically concludes her own life by guiding the sword of a hesitant gladiator to her own throat. Caught up in the rapture of her perseverance and corporeal duty, she shouts, I am a Christian and I follow the authority of my name that I shall be perpetual. Religious studies scholar L. Stephanie Cobb argues that Perpetua's narrative serves propagandistic identity forming functions within the Roman Catholic faith by demonstrating manly and thus Christian virtues such as autonomy, athleticism, and stoicism. 
Martyrs' acts, even when narrating the works of female saints, highlight masculinizing tropes, fueling these textual devices with persuasive, didactic stories, illuminating what it meant to be Christian. Perpetua's acts serve as a template that states that, quote, according to Cobb, Christian masculinity can be revealed in a most unexpected place, a woman. The power and punning quality of Vivia Perpetua's name, her transgender vision signifying perseverance and strength, and her legendary status as a conquering Christ-like figure sets a divine, fantastic precedent for Darger's Vivian girls. Virile female saints like Joan of Arc and Vivia Perpetua of Catholic legend boldly transgressed gender boundaries, emb embodying power and prestige that were traditionally the reserve of men. Darger's running and morphing child may well draw from the heritage of the saints becoming male. The defiant woman bearing male characteristics of active, active agency, vitality, and corporeal theatrics. This strong female elides within the playful metamorphosis of somatic boundaries between boys and girls in Darger's art. However, little girls on the run never fully conform to the signs of maleness. They visually morph along a swinging pendulum, remaining for Darger little girls, something entangling boy and girl, yet privileging the girl. Perpetuous and Joan of Arc stories prepare a foundation for Darger's superlative Vivian, a point of departure already venerable, allowing Darger to further experiment with and discover the possibilities of gender bending as a mode of reaching divine status. And I thought I might, since this is a local um, mosaic, the, um, I consulted with one of my um, colleagues who teaches Latin. And this is from, um, the writing there is from the, um, the Passion of St. Perpetua, uh, but it refers to St. Felicitas, who is to the right of Perpetua, who gave birth to a daughter two days before her martyrdom. She was also killed in the Colosseum along with Perpetua. And the phrase says, another will be within me who will suffer on my behalf. And then the rest of this phrase that's not in this mosaic, because, of, um, because I will be suffering for him, and him is capitalized. So um, it's about martyrdom and suffering and giving up of children, um, as well as giving up of life. And this is located here in DC. It is likely that the little girl on the run motif, and specifically its application to the Vivian girls, could be an image that the artist personally identified with. Or as likely, it could be an appropriated trope that the artist borrowed from a lineage of fantastic stories of Catholic saints. Or perhaps she's not exclu exclusively in one, of the, one or the other camp, and maybe a bit of both. What we can say is that she offers many more unanswered questions that resonate through her peculiar little girl body that is defiantly queer and devoutly Christian. Thank you. That expands engagement with projects like Relief really Free, including through an interactive timeline of Roe's life, which, which puts the limited biographical information that we have about Roe into the larger social and cultural context that shaped her life and eventual artistic breakthrough. From the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, just 30 miles away from where Roe lived, to the way that the mainstream art world first began embracing American artists without formal training in the decades following World War II. One, sorry. My talk today draws on many of the points you will find on this timeline, which I believe are key to understanding the radical nature of what Roe did by claiming her position as an artist when she did. One of the many problems with the long-standing tendency to celebrate self-taught artists as outsiders is that it denies their historical position, that they're people who are processing and being shaped by the world around them, and they do not need a formal artistic or any other kind of education, really, for these forces to impact their work significantly, whether we see content that is overtly political in their work or not. 
That timeline begins with this color-coded map that was among the many data visualizations that W.E.B. Du Bois presented in his groundbreaking American Negro exhibition at the Paris Exposition in 1900. It looks at the state of Georgia broken down by the number of black landowners in each county. The arrow is pointing to Fayette County, where Roe was born, the ninth of 10 children, to Sam and Luella Swanson Williams, who did not own their land. Roe had many fond memories of her childhood and her family, to whom she would remain close for the rest of her life, but she also acknowledged that she didn't really have a childhood because of the predatory systems of sharecropping and tenant farming that defined the Reconstruction Era South that demanded too much labor from too young of an age. She did go to school, at least seasonally, until the age of 10 at the nearby African Methodist congregation, where a teacher recognized the artistic talent that she showed even then. Her drawing on this slide details her memories of art making. Um, and what you're seeing is Roe kind of depicting herself three times. She called this drawing when I was a little girl. Um, and so she appears twice in the green outfits and once in the kind of lilac um, t-shirt and shorts. Um, and what you're seeing with the, the green version of her that's flowing in the top floating in the top register of the drawing this is her memory of how she created drawings on you know, any paper or surface that she could find. And then she would mix together a kind of paste from uh, sugar and water and use that to stick her drawings to her bedroom wall. Unfortunately, that attracted rats. And you can see the rat in the bottom of the picture and on, on that red kind of ground, um, which really angered her mother and created um, punishments for Roe, and so you see her mother holding a reed. But she loved her mother and had a wonderful relationship with her mother, and she's also receiving this kind of fruit maybe um, as a kind of reconciliation between them um, in her purple outfit. And then to the right, uh, at the far right of the, of the drawing, she's showing a doll. And that was another way that she practiced art from a very early age, was she made dolls out of fabric scraps and um, dirty clothes that she would kind of wrap up and turn into playthings for, for herself and her sisters um, until they had to be kind of undone on wash day. Um, in 1916, she married Ben Wheat, and they stayed in Fayetteville for a while. But Georgia agriculture was plagued by several droughts and boll weevil infestations in the mid to late 1920s, whose devastations were worsened by the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. Roe and Wheat left Fayetteville around 1930, moving 30 miles north to Vinings, a wealthy white community where Roe's nephew, Joe Brown, had found work and settled. And so in the drawing on the right of this slide, she depicts herself with, uh, with Joe, who was a nephew, but he was actually the son of one of Roe's much older sisters. So he was very close in age to her. And he remained a close friend and companion to her throughout her life. So in this drawing, she's celebrating their kind of lifelong friendship. Um, he even took her in to live with um, himself and his wife in 1937, when her husband, Ben Wheat, died suddenly from uh, an accident at the workplace, at the mill where he worked. Within a year, she remarried Henry Rowe, an older widower who already had grown children and suffered from dementia, passing just 10 years after their union in 1948. During both of her marriages, Rowe worked in domestic service for white households nearby, eventually finding decades-long employment with Buddy and Vera Smith. Rowe did make work that she dated to the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s, and I'm showing you some of it here, um, including a drawing uh, with a mournful plea, the drawing of the, of the blue and black figure um, who's surrounded by the words, oh boy, please let me be. And she made this drawing on a fidelity insurance pamphlet and dated it to 1947, which was actually a, a, an important and probably sorrowful year for her between uh, the death of her father and um, her, her, her husband, Henry, was very ill at this time and would die uh, the following year. But the way that Roe told her story was that she only really started making art again in 1968, a year whose tumultuous revelations of freedom and trauma are impossible to fully enumerate, but some of the events that may have had a direct bearing on her sense of personal safety, rights, and realization of her potential include the assass assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the passage of another Civil Rights Act, and the election of Shirley Chisholm. It was also the year that Rose ceased to serve anyone but herself. 
as Henry and her employers, the Smiths, were all laid to rest. Around this time, she transformed another pamphlet frontispiece. This one was part of the Bible Society's 1967 publication of the Gospel According to St. John, which it titled Really Free. Her transformation of this leaflet reflected her commitment to God, who she credited as a source of her talent, as well as her love of signing her name. Kathy Perry, one of Rose's grandnieces, remembers that her grand aunt often passed around a paper and crayons to the children who came to see her and challenged them by saying, I bet you can't write your name as pretty as I can. <laughs> the Bible Society leaflet is scarce in color and form compared to the exuberant drawings for which she would ultimately become the most celebrated. Yet it has inspired the title and many of the themes that structure the exhibition really free because it calls upon us to think about freedom and the ways that Roe radically laid claim to hers through art in the final years of her life. And you can see this is a, the kind of opening gallery installation at the High Museum and we used her signature as the inspiration for the graphic on the title wall. You can't see the small work is, is kind of exhibited to, to the left of the large photo mural, but it's there as well as a reference for, for the audience. Although Really Free the Exhibition is being expanded by some of the venues that are taking it, at its core, it's based on the High's extraordinary collection of Rose's work, which numbers more than 200 pieces. The High has this collection through the generosity of Judith Alexander, the Atlanta art dealer who began representing Roe in 1978. Alexander sold work uh, to Roe's financial benefit while the artist was alive, but as some of you might know, had great difficulty in parting with it after Roe's death. As Alexander planned for her own end of life in the early 2000s, she made the high the primary steward of Rose's legacy, giving the museum more than 130 works like this one. In this drawing, Rose pays tribute to Alexander, to whom she was bound by friendship as well as business. I have to note that the Rose and Alexander families remain close to this day. It is also an embodiment of how the complexity of Rose's compositions flourished once she gained access to large flat paper, courtesy of Alexander, in the late 1970s. Because before that, Rose used what was at hand, from the leaflet frontispieces I've showed you, to a shoebox that she flattened to turn into the substrate for a triptych, a Sara Lee pancake lid, which became a pendant for a smiling woman, or even her own chewing gum. Um, she chewed a lot of gum. She probably suffered from migraines, and at some point someone she trusted told her that chewing gum would help stop what she called the jumping in her head. Um, and she wanted to reuse everything that was part of just her ethos as an artist. And she discovered that if she chilled the gum for a while in her refrigerator, it became this wonderful consistency that she enjoyed molding. And so what you're seeing is this wonderful mustachioed cat sculpture um, in the High Museum's collection. And people brought her materials. I'll get to how people started visiting her in, in the early 70s. People started bringing her even their own chewing gum, um, which she found totally disgusting. Like she was happy to have other things, but she was kind of surprised and disgusted by the people who thought she might want their gum. A version of this mustachioed cat appears in one of the photographs that Roe affixed to this flattened shoebox. And these pictures by an unknown photographer are undated but they're probably from the late 1960s as they reveal her home in early stages of decoration. The outside, which you can see in the bottom right, is not yet fully adorned. And apart from the cat gum sculpture that I'm pointing to in the slide, her interiors are not yet chock full with her drawings and dolls as they would later become. By the early 1970s, Roe had increased her artistic attentions to the interior and exteriors of her homes, of her home creating an art environment that she called her playhouse because of how she saw her return to her love of art as a return to youth, as she put it, playing in her playhouse. A question that I get frequently is, does it still exist and what happened to it? Um, sadly, it doesn't. And I'm showing you uh, a photograph of myself and um, a former fellow who is one of the catalog contributors, De Destiny Fillmore. Um, in a 2020 visit we made to the site of her, uh, former, her former home site. And now it is the place of the Indigo Hotel, which is a boutique hotel chain that exists throughout the country and um, now has one in, in Vinings. 
But they've left this beautiful tree, and um, it's really one of the only trees standing on the strip of road. And in front of it, there's a plaque acknowledging her life, um, her existence there. And inside the hotel, they even have a kind of display of photographs of the playhouse, as well as some of her drawings. Um, and I don't know the whole story about how the playhouse came to be demolished. I think it's not all about gentrification, um, although gentrification in this area did disproportionately affect the black community that lived there. This was always a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, and I, my sense is that it had more to do with family politics because Rose, second husband, Henry, already had grown children. And what I hear is that they were you know, not necessarily totally copacetic with Nellie. And I think there was a desire to sell the property, which was increasing in value um, after her death. So her house no longer exists, but there are photographs and some archival footage um, of the playhouse and of her in the playhouse. And these archival documents became sources for uh, Ruchi Mittal, Petter Ringbaum, the filmmakers behind this, um, this uh, amazing documentary that will soon make its world premiere called This World Is Not My Own. Um, faced with this kind of absence of so many different things uh, in regard to Roe's life, the filmmakers decided to take a note from Roe and to play and to be creative, and they recreated or reimagined her home using the kinds of materials that she favored in her own work. So in the miniature that you see of her house's exterior, um, that tree on the far right, which is probably the same tree that's still standing in, in the, the photograph from 2020, that's, the leaves are all colored popcorn. Um, it, it's made from old marker caps and cut up wine corks and those kinds of reused materials that, um, that Roe loved. And what they've done with these sets is they've animated scenes from her life that are uh, recorded in oral histories and kind of poor quality archival footage that they can't use in full for their documentary. So it's a really tremendous experimental approach to documentary. And these sets were in the presentation of the exhibition at the High Museum and they're also in the presentation at Brooklyn. So though it no longer exists, the playhouse is really essential to understanding Rose's art. I love looking at photographs and uh, film of her playhouse against her drawings uh, because together they tell a story of an aesthetic of abundance mm -hmm. that she created in space and on paper. So Roe drew a lot of animals. Um, there are certain animals like dogs and roosters and fish that reappear again and again throughout her work. And there's been wonderful work done by people like Lee Kogan, who was the curator of the first major retrospective on Roe or one of the first major retrospectives on Roe in 1999, that talk about the symbolic possibilities of these animals. But looking at the, at the, at the photographs of the playhouse, what you also recognize that the, is that these were toys. These were things that Roe kept around the house. Um, she had so many stuffed dogs, um, inflatable rabbits. Um, you know, she had loved toy animals, and she didn't keep any live animals at the house, but these were things that she used in her artistic installations and that brought you know, comfort and excitement to her. And so when you start to see these correspondences between things in her drawings and um, things in her, in her yard art, um, I think it's really illuminating. Um, and again, it's not just about making one-to-one -one correlations, but just even understanding that this aesthetic of fullness was something that reigned in both two and three dimensions for her, right? So the flattened space that you see in her drawings, the way that she wove together all of these different vignettes that you know, go from the bottom of the page all the way to the top, that was also how she installed objects all around um, her yard and inside of her house. Everything was floor to ceiling or ground to tree branch as far as she was concerned. So over the course of her life, um, the area that she lived in changed dramatically. And I'm showing you an aerial view of her home site uh, in Vining circa 1930. She lived on a really busy road called Paces Ferry Road. And the photograph on the right is another wonderful um, photo taken by Melinda Blauvelt in 1971 that captures one of her dolls from behind. And you can see in the distance beyond the fence how her yard just like came right up to the road. And this is important because um, she was very exposed. And that's one of the things that, that I've tried to, to help people understand. This yard installation um, was something that brought so much attention, both wanted and unwanted, um, into her sphere. And for instance, this, this doll 
and I haven't, I haven't shown you, I realized last night when I was going through this presentation, I'm not showing you really any, any images of her dolls, but she, can, she returned to doll making um, in, in her adulthood and made wonderful dolls. This is, this is the largest one she ever made, and we're seeing it from behind with its kind of like Uncle Sam-like hat on. She called it her old man, and it was a kind of sentry. You know, she put it outside, and people wrote um, letters uh, later that, that record that they actually mistook this large doll for a man. So it was a kind of like bodyguard to her. Um, and in fact, it was vandalized and later stolen um, from her yard. That's all in particular. So I want to just emphasize the vulnerability um, of, of, of the way that she put herself out there. I'll also just say that the National Gallery right now has their Call to Create exhibition, which includes some work by Roe, and it also includes a wonderful immersive video experience where you get to see footage of the artists um, working you know, in their studios and yards and home places. And uh, one of the vignettes they show of Roe is of her caring for her dolls. Um, she painted their nails, she did their hair, you know, she fashioned these amazing outfits for them. Um, and, and it's just, I, hope, I highly recommend going um, and, and experiencing the exhibition and, and paying attention um, to the way that, uh, that she really kind of, she didn't just make the dolls, you know, she lived with them and celebrated them and cared for them. So a couple years after the photograph that I just showed you was taken, Roe was the subject of a profile in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, um, which to Mark's point about the horrible um, article that he showed regarding Yoakum, it had an appalling headline, um, all I got, got out here is junk, was the headline. But it did have beautiful photographs of her in her yard, which are fairly unique because they show um, these blossoming trees. A lot of the photographs that, that we happen to have of her playhouse don't show um, her yard and her garden in bloom, but these do, even though they're not great quality. So I love that about them. And this article also noted how her, her playhouse was causing traffic on Paces Ferry Road. Um, she lived right across the train tracks, and apparently by this time, when the article was written in 1973, it was decorated enough that there were a lot of rubberneckers who were um, causing traffic jams. And in fact, just two weeks after this article was published, Roe began keeping guest books. So I'm showing you um, the way that she decorated her first guest book uh, in the top image, and then below it are entries of people's signatures and also the wonderful notes that they wrote to her. And this is the first of 12 guest books that Roe kept. Uh, and people didn't just leave their addresses and their names. They wrote her these incredible messages about how she was like no one they'd ever met and how she changed their lives. And, and so she started keeping this guest book right after this article was published. So you have to assume that she got an influx of visitors from you know, this kind of press. And I can't say you know, with any certainty what the demographic breakdown of these visitors were, but again, she lived in a, in a largely white, affluent neighborhood. And so I can say with certainty that many of them were white. And this was just unbelievable. I mean, when I think about it now that she was a black woman living alone um, in this, on this very busy street, um, she did experience, again, vandalism. People threw firecrackers into her yard, threw eggs at her. Um, she was doing all of this and, and basically exp you know, opening up for this kind of social practice where she was welcoming people to experience this world that she had created. And she was doing this against this backdrop of, uh, of white supremacist violence that really governed her life. So Atlanta likes to be known as the cradle of the civil rights movement, the birthplace of Dr. King, you know, a city too busy to hate. But there's really much more to the story than that. Um, in his award-winning book, White Flight, Kevin Cruz chronicles the residential migrations of white people in Atlanta in response to the influx of black residents moving to the city for economic opportunity, just like Roe and her family did. This also contributed to the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan and other racial terror throughout the city and larger region. In the middle image, I'm showing you um, a Klan rally uh, the Klan was revived when Roe was 15 in Stone Mountain, Georgia, just east of Atlanta. Uh, and Stone Mountain would also, in Roe's lifetime, become the largest Confederate memorial in the world. The picture at center shows an initiation ceremony of 1946, which was a prelude to lynchings that made national news later that summer. 
At right is a headline announcing the murders of Maceo Snipes, Roger and Dorothy Malcolm, and George and May, Mur May Murray Dorsey, black Georgians who dared vote in the gubernatorial primary, which was the first election held in Georgia without a statewide ban on black voting. It was a primary that led to the reelection of Eugene Talmadge, an arch segregationist and white supremacist who would have served a fourth consecutive term as governor of Georgia if he hadn't died that November. The governor's mansion is on Paces Ferry Road. It's on the same road where Roe lived. The governor's mansion was just five miles away from where she lived. This is a work that she made in response to voting rights, and she spoke about it in her lifetime and decoded it in this way. Uh, to the left of her hand is the image um, of a woman that she identified as being Coretta Scott King. And then above her signature are two people uh, who she, she said were voters lined up at the polls who were shedding tears of happiness um, at being able to vote, but also potentially fear at the retribution that they might receive. And then to the far right is a politician who has many faces, mm -hmm. which just shows the kind of distrust of politicians and the electoral process that Roe maintained throughout the course of her life. She didn't, um, she, she didn't always vote. There are other examples of how she responded indirectly to racial violence in her midst, um, and they include these drawings that she made about the Atlanta child murders, which were a horrific series of molestations and killings that occurred in Atlanta from 1979 to 1981, um, in which 30 young black children and adolescents were abducted, murdered. This is a case that's been recently reopened by our former mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, um, because there was a person who was convicted of these crimes, Wayne Williams, but um, at the time, in 1981, uh, up until now, there's been a kind of understanding that, that Wayne Williams almost definitely wasn't the only person who was responsible for these crimes. The KKK was probably involved. There were other people involved. And so there was an immense amount of trust within the black community of Atlanta and, and remains so about this crime being solved. And Roe here is showing us in very coded ways the kind of fear um, that she and her family were experiencing. She did not have children, but she had many grandnieces and nephews who were of the age of children who were being abducted at this time. And what you see in the image at left are, are probably television screens that she scatters kind of throughout the picture, um, a, a mother with her baby, um, a hand outstretched um, next to a baby and the kind of indeterminate animal. And then to the right is an image with this, well, and then I'll just say also about that, that drawing on the left, this is a very threatening figure at the center. Um, and, and I think you know, the way that they're drawing their cape apart reminds me of kind of flashers and sexual violence. Um, so that's my reading of the work. To the right is an image of an orange rat who's um, in front of this kind of forest, and you can't really tell from the reproduction, but when you look closely at the image in person, there are tiny figures in the forest who are, who are disappearing. Um, so she's kind of, hasn't shown violence in very overt ways, but she's coding it through, um, you know, through her own kind of, through her own symbols and, um, and experience. So these are among the only works in, in which Roe responded to political and social events in, in a way that she really shared. But as I indicated at the outset of my talk, my position is that everything she made was political because through it she was demanding the respect and visibility that she had so long been denied as a black woman living in the American South. This work, Real Girl, is one of at least a dozen drawings in which Roe embedded a picture of herself, embracing various visible dimensions of her identity and their intersections. As she told one reporter in 1979, I'm black and I love my blackness. Here she's placed her signature, another key representation of self, at the literal heart of the composition, beneath the photograph. She asserts that she's a real girl, and uses traditionally feminine visual elements like the color bright pink, lacy edges, flowers, and a, the heart arabesque to complete this valentine to herself. As far as I know, she didn't go to voter registration drives, civil rights protests, or feminist rallies. But she read the paper and watched the news and must have been aware of women like 
Claudia Jones and Dorothy Bolden, who began sounding the alarm for black women's issues in the 1940s and 50s, including calling attention to the disproportionate number of black women like Roe, who labored in the unregulated industry of domestic service. In 1970, the same year, that Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm wrote her rallying cry for black women to rebel against the dual systems of patriarchy and racism, Bolden was successful in establishing the first ever Maid's Honors Day, a proclamation signed in Atlanta by then Governor Jimmy Carter. So drawings like this, in which Roe declares, my house is clean enough to be healthy and dirty enough to be happy, they're more than just an embodiment of Rose's sense of humor and the tickle she got from the napkin bearing that catchphrase she saw at a relative's house. I believe the phrase stuck with her and made it into her art, uh, not just here, but repeatedly. She drew this phrase multiple times because of how it expressed her bold rejection of the roles that she had been pigeonholed into her whole life as a wife and a domestic worker. A year after Roe died, Alice Walker published her seminal essay, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, in which she asks, quote, how was the creativity of the black woman kept alive year after year and century after century, when for most of the years black people have been in America, it was a punishable crime for a black person to read or write? And the freedom to paint, to sculpt, to expand the mind with action did not exist. Walker's own mother, Minnie Tallulah Grant Walker, was born just 12 years after Roe in Eatonton County, Georgia. And Walker writes about how her garden was her domain of power and self-realization. I notice that it is only, this is Walker again, I notice that it is only when my mother is working in her flowers that she is radiant, almost to the point of being invisible, except as creator, hand and eye. She is involved in work her soul must have, ordering the universe in the image of her personal conception of beauty. For her, so hindered and intruded upon in so many ways, being an artist has been a daily part of her life. This ability to hold on, even in very simple ways, is work black women have done for a very long time." End quote. What Roe did, not only through her art, but through the oasis that she created for herself with her playhouse, and including its blossoming trees and bushes, which you can see her enjoying in this uh, drawing on the left, she's smelling what I think is a mulberry tree. This was a form of self-care, of maintaining a connection to nature and creating a space for creativity and for rest. One of the essays in the Really Free Catalog by Destiny Fillmore, who you saw with me in that, in that uh, photograph from, from Roe's home site, muses on the many chairs that stood in Rose's yard and appeared in her art. The presence of chairs in yard environments has been analyzed and examined by scholars like Gray Gundiker and Judith McWillie for their potential spiritual resonance and entwinement with African diasporic belief systems. Fillmore acknowledges this, but also emphasizes how the playhouse and the art that Roe created there provided Roe with rest, as well as economic independence through the sale of her art. Instead of relying on a man as a source of income, she was able to, as Fillmore notes, sit herself down. In addition to her signatures, an important icon of Rose's selfhood that appears throughout her work are her hands. She traced them and decorated them, painting her nails, adding her jewelry, often celebrating the color of her skin. She said, and this is the work that, and the quote that we have used through the various presentations of the Really Free Exhibition to kind of close the show. The pictures I'm proud of are, that, are the ones that I've made of my hand. I leave my hand on the wall. When I'm gone, they can see a print of my hand. I love that to see a print of my hand. I'll be gone to rest, but they can look back and say that is Nellie May's hand. Roe had enough success at the end of her life to believe that her art would be preserved and celebrated for generations to come. But this was still a very bold position to take in an era when black artists were fighting for visibility and representation in the mainstream institutions of the art world. And I'm showing you a very famous photograph of Faith Ringgold with her daughter, Michelle Wallace, at uh, the, the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, the BECC protests at the Whitney Museum in 1971. Um, and then uh, an image of Alma Thomas, who is another Georgia native, 
uh, and who became the first black woman artist to have a solo show at the Whitney Museum in 1972. And we just heard about how Yoakum's work was shown there, although maybe not embraced as fulsomely as it should have been. Um, and of course, there was another wonderful self-taught artist, Minnie Evans, who, who had a solo show at the Whitney um, in 1974. Roe Ro didn't show her work there, um, but she did have a big New York moment in 1979 when Judith Alexander, who had just started showing her work in Atlanta, worked with Betty Parsons, who had a, a, a kind of collaboration with another gallerist, Carol Dreyfus, uh, the Parsons Dreyfus Gallery. And in 1979, they gave Nellie Mae Rowe a solo show. And Nellie traveled to New York with Judith and some other artists um, who were based in Atlanta. One of them was Lucinda Bunnen, who took a lot of photographs of Rowe over the course of, of her life. And this work on the left is um, another transformation that, that Rowe made of, of a photograph that was given to her, this one by Lucinda. And it's an amazing piece where it's constructed this uh, styrofoam embellished and painted styrofoam frame around it. And she's written, you can't really see it, uh, Dear Lord, let us keep the peace, because her and, her and Judith are actually fighting. Um, apparently, they often disagreed about fashion. Judith was very um, not feminine and um, you know, had just a different sense of fashion. And Nellie uh, made her own clothes often. And, um, and like to present herself in a certain way. And so Judith had brought an outfit for Nellie to wear to the opening. Nellie said she was gonna put it on, but then while Judith was in the shower, she put on her own clothes. And so they're standing in front of the mirror arguing. Um, I thought for a long time they were actually at the gallery, um, like looking at art and talking about art, but they're, they're arguing about clothes. Um, so anyhow, this was, this was a big moment. Roe um, relished her experience in New York, though she was not very impressed by her experience at art museums, she loved going to Harlem, Central Park, the Statue of Liberty, and there's just so many wonderful photographs that were taken of her um, uh, having this amazing experience in New York in that moment. Um, she was already getting sick at that time, and in 1982, when the Corcoran organized its groundbreaking exhibition, Black Folk Art in America, which opened the Corcoran and then traveled to six venues around the country, Roe was unfortunately too sick um, to, to travel to those openings. And I'm showing you in the middle a loan form from the Corcoran to Judith Alexander because she was really the major lender of Roe's work to that exhibition. And Roe was one of only three women artists um, in that exhibition. So wrapping up, the Brooklyn Museum took that show in the summer of, of 1982. And now they have uh, Nellie Mae Rowe back in their galleries with uh, really free The Radical Art of Nellie Mae Rowe. And one of the ways that they expanded the show was they brought in, in the opening wall, what you're seeing are all of these other drawings where she used her signature as the kind of focal point of the work. I'm thrilled that it's at the Brooklyn Museum where it's really becoming part of this expanding feminist uh, art history canon. You know, they've been doing so many amazing solo exhibitions as well as group exhibitions that have really changed um, who we think of when we think of feminist artists of the second half of the 20th century and into the present. Um, and they added this wonderful work by the Guerrilla Girls where Nellie Mae Rowe is listed among the many other women artists who could have been had in the late 80s for the price of a single Jasper Johns painting. So it's been exciting to watch the show get attention as it's traveled around. And what's most thrilling is that um, people are really responding to this contextualization of Roe as radical, this contextualization of Roe as, um, as a feminist artist. And, and nothing captures that more than Roberta Smith's print um, headline, The Walls Come Tumbling Down. So thank you. I hope you will go see the show at the Brooklyn Museum. I hope you will check out our row resources at link.row.high.org and also hopefully check out the print catalog. Um, and I'd like to welcome Matthew Hicks to the stage.
Um, hi, everybody. It's just asking me to join the uh, Smithsonian's web uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, my name is Matthew Higgs. Um, I'm, uh, since 2004, I've been the director and chief curator of White Columns, uh, which is New York's oldest alternative art space, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Leslie Umberger and everyone at the Smithsonian uh, for the invitation to speak today on the occasion of the exhibition, We Are Made of Stories, of work by self-taught artists from the Robson Family Collection. And thanks also to all of the previous speakers for their illuminating insights. Um, I was invited today to speak to the work of Judith Scott and Dan Miller, two artists who are very prominently represented in We Are Made of Stories with a really extraordinary group, especially of Judith Scott's works, maybe the best I've seen formerly in private hands. Uh, both Judith and Dan Miller are artists who are associated with Oakland's Creative Growth Art Center. Uh, indeed, Dan still works at Creative Growth's downtown Oakland studio. And it was very interesting to hear Leslie mention this morning that just two of the artists in the exhibition are still with us. Um, Dan is one of those two. Uh, I have a personal history with both artists. In 2007, I organized Dan Miller's first ever solo exhibition at White Columns. And with Catherine Morris from the Brooklyn Museum, I co-curated Judith Scott's first American retrospective in 2014 at the Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And I concur. I think the Catherine Morris and her team at the Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum are really doing some of the most extraordinary curatorial work in our field. Uh, the Brooklyn exhibition of Judith's work then traveled to the Aspen Art Museum. Uh, I don't think it's possible to speak to Judith and Dan's work, uh, so my presentation will have a slightly different character than today's previous speakers. I don't think it's possible to speak to Judith and Dan's work, uh, nor their emergence as artists without a wider consideration of creative growth itself. So my presentation this afternoon will seek to locate their work within the wider context of both creative growth and also the arts and disabilities movement, uh, a narrative that creative growth played and continues to play a central role within. Uh, but before I start or go any further, I should explain the images that you can see behind me. Um, they're installation shots of an exhibition that I recently organized for the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, that opened this past May, and which will be on view through May of 2023. The exhibition is titled Creative Growth, uh, with each word followed by an exclamation mark. The exhibition is the first survey dedicated to a history of the Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland, and it features work by more than 22 artists who've worked in its Oakland studios, including Dan Miller and Judith Scott. Their works are presented alongside a documentary film by Cheryl Dunn and archival materials relating to the organization's history over the past 48 years. Uh, Creative Growth will celebrate its 50th anniversary in 2024, uh, a truly momentous milestone. The text that you can see occasionally uh, running around the exhibition space above the gray painted walls, uh, almost like a frieze, are quotes from Creative Growth's founders, the artist Florence Luden Katz and her husband, the psychologist Elias Katz. The Kohler exhibition is the culmination of a now 20 year long an ongoing conversation between myself, Creative Growth, its artists, and its staff, including its long-serving director, Tom DeMaria, who's with us today, and will uh, lead uh, the Q&A uh, with Leslie following my presentation. Uh, so anyhow, if you should happen to be anywhere near Milwaukee or Sheboygan in the next eight months, I'd strongly encourage you to stop by the Kohler Arts Center. So I thought I'd begin my presentation uh, with uh, a bold opening statement. Uh, so here it goes. It's my sincere belief that the Bay Area Centers, founded by the artist Florence Luden Katz and her psychologist husband, Elias Katz, that is Oakland's Creative Growth Art Center, San Francisco's Creativity Explored, and Richmond's NIAD, are among the most important and culturally relevant organ arts organizations in the world and that they are the equal, uh, that they are of art, equal art historical significance as the Bauhaus or the Black Mountain College. I truly believe that. 
Earlier this year, in February 2022, I posted on my Instagram account, at Matthew Higgs 2015, if you wish to follow me, uh, an open letter to Christopher Bedford, who at the time was the incoming new director of San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art. He's now the director. But it was in many ways an open letter to everyone in the contemporary art community, also known as the art world. In my post, I proposed the question. This is the question. What is the most important development in the visual arts in the Bay Area in the past 50 years? In case anyone had any doubts, I also provided the answer. <laughs> the answer is the ongoing work of the three Bay Area centers founded by the artist Florence Luden Katz and her husband Elias Katz, Oakland's Creative Growth Art Center, San Francisco's Creativity Explored, and Richmond's NIAD. This is not my subjective opinion. It's an unarguable fact. There are lots of interesting art historical narratives that have emerged in the Bay Area over the past half century, but none can match the radical ambitions of the Katz's visionary ideas. The Katz's work has had a greater impact socially, culturally, and politically than any art historical movement or avant-garde associated with Northern California during the same era. Yeah, as I, yet, as I pointed out in my open letter, you wouldn't know this if you visited San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art. That the region's leading museum of modern and contemporary art fails to acknowledge the most important and the most radical developments in the visual arts, made in its own backyard over the past 50 years, seemed to me to be an extraordinary curatorial and institutional oversight. The past five years have seen an unprecedented questioning of the role of the museum, a re-examination of what the museum stands for, and who the museum both represents and seeks to serve. Important and necessary changes have started to be made. For example, artistry is increasingly no longer so white and so male, which is obviously a good start. Yet despite these good intentions, the Contemporary Art Museum still stubbornly refuses to engage with art's relationship with disability, and with the communities of artists with disabilities, and the organizations that support them, both nationally and beyond. My proposal to San Francisco's Museum of Art was pretty straightforward. I broke it down into four areas for action. One, SFMOMA should immediately acquire the archives of these three pioneering Bay Area organizations. Two, they should collect the work of artists affiliated with these organizations in depth. Three, they should create a permanent space within the museum dedicated to the CATS's ideas. And four, they should incorporate the work of artists with disabilities throughout their collection displays. If they did this, overnight, San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art would become the only major museum of modern and contemporary art that actively supports, collects, presents, and contextualizes the work of contemporary artists with disabilities. Such a move would have a transformative impact on the museum, on its audience, and ultimately on art history. I close my Instagram post saying, and I quote, as museums struggle to reimagine themselves, to better reflect the communities they seek to serve, San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art has a unique opportunity to become a powerful advocate for the work of artists with disabilities. Of course, this doesn't just apply to SF MoMA. It applies to MoMA in New York, the Hirshhorn in DC, the Tate in London, and indeed to every arts museum in the world. Every museum should by now, i.e. 2022, have dedicated members of staff who are actively researching the contemporary arts and disabilities field. Visiting centers such as Creative Growth, Cincinnati's Visionaries and Voices, and others, learning from their example and acquiring work for their permanent collections. It seems so straightforward. There's literally no reason not to do it, yet it isn't happening. The contemporary art world's refusal to formally engage with this extraordinarily rich and extraordinarily fertile creative field is frankly mystifying. So in order to better understand the work of Judith Scott and Dan Miller, and also how they came to be artists, or how they came to be known as artists, we should briefly consider the origins of creative growth and the cats as ideas. Uh, in many respects, the, the exhibition that's currently up in Sheboygan was an attempt to uh, translate these thoughts into the, the form of a exhibition itself. 
Oakland's Creative Growth Arts Center was founded in 1974 by an artist, Florence Luden Katz, who was born in 1912 and died in 1990, and her psychologist husband, Elias Katz, who was born in 1913 and died in 2008. Now approaching its 50th anniversary, Creative Growth is the preeminent center for artists with disabilities in the United States and has in turn become a model for similar centers, both nationally and internationally. Creative growth emerged from the larger social, cultural, and political narratives of the late 1960s and early 1970s, including the women's, gay, and civil rights movements. The disabilities rights movement flourished in California, especially during this era, and the Katzes were amongst its most far-sighted advocates. My colleague Catherine Morris wrote extensively about the political origins of creative growth in her essay, Judith Scott and the Politics of Biography, which clearly relates to today's symposium, for the monograph that accompanied Judith Scott's Brooklyn Retrospective. And if you have a copy of the book or can find one, I'd encourage you to read it. At Creative Growth, the Katz has established a unique and fiercely independent environment where disabled individuals would be empowered to explore their own creativity at their own pace. Artists can remain at creative growth for their entire life, which in itself is a truly extraordinary idea. Where else can that happen in our current society? The staff members at creative growth, invariably practicing artists and not teachers in any conventional sense, as no formal instruction takes place. Rather, the staff work alongside the artists with disabilities introducing them to new materials and processes, and when necessary, offering practical and technical assistance, supporting the artist in their idiosyncratic, in the idiosyncratic approaches to self-expression. In establishing creative growth, the CATS has presciently identified the need to create environments where individuals with disabilities would be encouraged and supported in exploring their creative potential. Discussing the need for such centers, the CATS has suggested that and I'm quoting, the strengths of people with disabilities can be brought out only if there are opportunities. Art centers help these persons fulfill themselves and become contributors to society, especially in times like these, when they are already denied so many opportunities, we must not do away with their right to express themselves as human beings, nor can we compromise principles and ideals. There is no better time than the present to follow through on this philosophy. End quote. Central to the Katz's philosophy was the straightforward but ultimately radical notion that everyone, and I quote, no matter how mentally, physically, or emotionally disabled, was a potential artist. This idea of the creative potential that exists within everyone is central to an understanding of creative growth and would play a critical role in the subsequent development and identity of artists such as Judith Scott and Dan Miller. My first encounter with Creative Growth took place in 2002, by which time Creative Growth had already been operating for more than 25 years. Writing about this experience later in 2015, I said the following, quote, when I arrived in the Bay Area, I was unaware of the existence of Creative Growth. I came across it almost by accident whilst exploring my new neighborhood near downtown Oakland. We'd moved from London to the Bay Area in the previous year. Creative Growth studio and gallery were visible from the street. Floor to ceiling windows revealed to even the most casual passerby the creative activity unfolding within. I can clearly remember standing on the sidewalk and observing a group of people going about their business making things. Some people were in wheelchairs, many sat at desks, while others worked on looms or on ceramic projects. It was evident, even at first glance, and without any knowledge of what creative growth was, that something extraordinary was happening inside. Crossing the threshold into the center's gallery and the studio for that first time was and remains the single most significant encounter I've had with art. Everything I thought I knew about art up to that moment both subtly and dramatically changed. If art, if art had previously seemed a somewhat ambiguous or at least amorphous idea, at creative growth, it appeared to be a tangible and life-affirming force. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, please, no break yet. Those slides are supposed to continue running. I don't know how to do that, so maybe someone can help me rerun the slideshow. Um, 
Everything I thought I knew about art up to that moment both subtly and dramatically changed. I'm going to try and do it myself. Just leave it there. That's fine, we can just leave it there. Um, everything I thought I knew about art up to that moment both subtly and dramatically changed. If art had previously seemed like a somewhat ambiguous or at least amorphous idea, at creative growth it appeared to be tangible and a life-affirming force. Art's potential, its ability to represent and transform an individual's life was viscerally present. It was, as if, it was as if I was encountering art, or perhaps more accurately, the purpose of art, for the very first time. No, no, I'm just going to, no, no. I'll, I'll let you do your work. <laughs> On that initial visit uh, in 2002, I met the artist Judith Scott, Dan Miller, William Scott, and Ori Ramirez in Creative Growth Studios, all of whom I would subsequently organize solo exhibitions with in New York. I was blindsided by what I encountered that day. It wasn't just that the work being produced at Creative Growth was, ex was, was extraordinary, which it was. It was also the palpable sense of community present in the studio that was unlike any other creative environment I'd previously encountered. The communal atmosphere at Creative Growth ran counter to any preconceptions we might have about so-called outsider artists. As the curator Larry Rinder said, centers such as Creative Growth, quote, offer an experience that is in many ways, <laughs> leave it there, it's fine. As the curator Larry Rinder said, centers such as Creative Growth, quote, offer an experience that is in many ways the antithesis of that envisaged by the art critic Roger Cardinal in 1972, when he coined the term outsider art to identify the work of artists who have no contact with the art world and who are physically or mentally isolated. In 2006, now living in New York, I encouraged the writer James Trainer, at the time a US editor of Freeze Magazine, to visit Creative Growth on a trip he was making to the Bay Area. He ended up writing an article for Freeze entitled Experimental Art which is an extremely precise description of what happens at creative growth. Trainer's article remains one of the most lucid and powerful accounts of the Katz's ideas. Approaching creative growth with caution, the trainer wrote, and I'm quoting, I had half expected a depressing exercise in art therapy. What I found was something distinctly different. A lofty former car body shop transformed into a beehive of focused energy and actively staffed by professional artists with facilities for drawing, painting, sculpture, ceramics, and the fabric arts. In fact, it was a lot like art school, except without the self-doubt, posing, competition, and careerism. <laughs> Creative growth isn't a hospital, a clinic, a dumping ground, or even a school in the strictest sense. No formal instruction is given, and there are no theoretical programs about how to educate the autistic or schizophrenic. What it is, is an experiment, now entering its fourth decade at the time, rooted in a distinctly Northern Californian 1960s and 1970s ideas about grassroots involvement, collective creation, and social change, about giving disenfranchised people the tools, space, and support to express themselves. It's worth repeating Trainer's last observation, quote, what it is, is an experiment rooted in a distinctly Northern Californian 1960s and 1970s ideas about grassroots involvement, collective creation, and social change, about giving disenfranchised people the tools, sorry, the tools, space, and su support to express themselves. Have some water. This almost utopian collision of free expression and shared purpose is perhaps the defining characteristic of creative growth. The social and creative collectivity that both I and Trainer witnessed underscored and reinforced the Katz's desires to establish an inclusive, equitable, and non-hierarchical environment, one where individuals such as Dan Miller and Judith Scott might thrive. The Katz's were convinced that such a place would have a tr transformative impact not only on the lives of the individuals who attended the center, but also on the wider cultural landscape. It was into this ambitious and ongoing social and artistic experiment 
that Judith Scott arrived on April the 1st in 1987. Born in 1943, prior to her arrival at Creative Growth, she had spent the previous 36 years of her life, since the age of seven, institutionalized. Diagnosed with Down syndrome in her childhood, Scott's development was inhibited by her inability to speak, a condition that would long mask the fact that she was also deaf. Judith's deafness wasn't diagnosed until she was in her 30s. During her institutionalization, Scott had shown no artistic leanings. Yet she would emerge within one year of her arrival at Creative Growth as one of the most important artists of the late 20th century. Without Creative Growth and its investment and its unstinting belief in Judith's potential as both an individual and as an artist, it's highly unlikely that her latent creativity would have emerged and manifested in the sculptural objects for which she is now known, now known and which you can obviously see in the current exhibition. Reading the Katz's ideas, Uh, some of which they published in book form in 1990, is akin to reading a manifesto. About the, centers about the centers they founded, the Katz has said, and I quote, the art center sees each person, no matter how mentally, physically, or emotionally disabled, as a potential artist, and seeks to develop the ability to create and grow through rich and varying art experiences within a supportive environment. Disabilities are not viewed as illness, as in the medical model, but as obstacles which can be overcome. The art center is an open studio where people work at their own pace, without pressure, with materials they choose, and where teachers act as helpers or facilitators when needed. Growth in art and in the total person takes place through the student's own wish to fulfill their inner needs and to communicate with others through their art. There is no time-limited period of attendance so there, since there is no end to creativity and growth." End quote. Over the 17 years she spent at Creative Growth before her death in 2005, Judith Scott produced more than 150 sculptural works of extraordinary complexity. Similarly, Dan Miller, since his arrival at Creative Growth in 1992, has produced a staggering body of work, rooted in drawing, that explores and tests the limits of our relationships with language, legibility, and abstraction. Both Scott's and Miller's works operate something like a rebus, like an aesthetic puzzle. Scott's cocoon-like wrap sculptures, which invariably contain hidden or secreted objects, are effectively a form of sculptural concealment. In Miller's drawn, painted, and typed clouds of language, words overlapped, piled on top of each other. Um, uh, words overlap, piled on top of each other to a point of illegibility. Uh, this is an anecdote. An uh, anonymous visitor uh, to Dan Miller's White Columns exhibition in 2007 wrote in the, the gallery's visitor's book, they wrote, what is this shit? Uh, whilst I don't agree with how they chose to express themselves, I think they inadvertently asked an interesting question, which is, what exactly are we looking at when we encounter Miller's work? Indeed, the same question could be asked of Judith Scott's work too. What is this shit? The work of Scott, who was mute, and that of Miller, who is largely nonverbal, present myriad obstacles and, I would suggest, very interesting problems for the curator, the art historian, the critic, and indeed for the museum itself. In her essay about Judith Scott from the Brooklyn Catalog, Catherine Morris addressed these issues. I'm quoting In the context of art history and art criticism, Judith Scott's exhibition also examines the long, unresolved, and losing struggle, losing struggle to categorize and quantify art by people with disabilities into its own school, movement, or practice, which extract these artists from the general context of the cultures we all live within. Linked to this are the unresolved questions concerning how best to balance the incorporation of biographical information about an artist within a larger critical discussion of their work. Again, uh, thoughts that are very pertinent to the, today's symposium. Speaking directly to Scott's retrospective, Morris suggested that the exhibition ultimately represented a conversation, and I'm quoting, about biography, history, social politics, and a remarkable, remarkable body of work that doesn't actually address any of these things. 
And so ultimately, we are also simply presenting a voice in the contemporary art world that resonates, challenges, and engages us. This emphasis placed on the artist's biography is a persistent conundrum in the presentation and contextualization of the work of folk, outsider, and self-taught artists. And uh, as Leslie mentioned at the, the very introduction today, these terms uh, you know, are constantly in flux. The current exhibition's title, we are, all made of, we are Made of Stories, alludes to this dilemma too, as we are indeed all made of stories. In 2012, Freeze Magazine convened a round table discussion on the subject of outsider art, which was moderated by the Los Angeles-based writer Jonathan Griffin. I participated, along with the artists Robert Gober and Paul LaFoley, and the artist and therapist David McLagan. An edited transcript of our conversation was published in the magazine. The question of artist biography and the emphasis placed on it in the framing of the work of self-taught artists was a recurring thread in our conversation. Uh, when the moderator Griffin asked specifically about this tendency, this was my response. And again, this was in 2012, so a decade ago. A uh, quote from myself. Our collective lives have never been more greatly exposed, whether through reality television, social media, or the growing market for personal memoirs. So I think it's fair to say that people are interested in other people's lives. Uh, it's fair to say that people are interested in other people's stories. Historically, the focus on an outsider artist's biography often compensated for the absence of the artist's voice, especially in the case of artists whose disabilities prevented any conventional form of communication, such as Judith Scott, who was deaf mute and also had Down syndrome or where the artist worked outside of public scrutiny, as with someone like Henry Dagger. What's perhaps more surprising is the extent to which biography is suppressed in the discussion of contemporary artists. This absence of personal and anecdotal information might explain why the New Yorker's extensive profiles of artists are so popular. They provide one of the few places where we get to read about what an artist's parents did, for example, or what their partners do. Being empathetic towards or having an understanding of an artist's personal circumstances doesn't, I think, preclude an ability to think about their work in any number of interesting ways. This applies to the work of both self-taught and more conventionally trained artists. Uh, the next comment in the interview was from Robert Gober, who said, I agree, well put. Uh, I only mention that because I'm a huge fan of Robert Gober. <laughs> Uh, the moderator, Robert Griffin, continued this line of questioning. And of course, this is a decade ago, but this is a, a line of questioning that you know, predates my relationship with this field, and it will predate, it will follow us uh, into the future too. Uh, Jonathan Griffin asked, and I'm quoting, I wanted to acknowledge that when an artist's biography is foregrounded, we tend to triangulate our response to their work with the motivations that we imagine produced it. He's saying, for instance, when I look at Judith Scott's sculptures, I cannot help but understand them by channeling my projection of the artist's own relationship with her work. I would argue it's impossible to respond only to the subject depicted in any work of art by any artist, but as soon as we know even a tiny bit about the makeup. And I can't help imagining that life for Judith Scott was very much harder than it is for me. I might well be wrong. I suppose we will never know. This was my response. Quote, I think it's more complicated than that. At least 90% of the art we currently see in contemporary art museums and galleries has broadly similar origins. The artists in question will most likely have studied at college level, and they will have been exposed to an approved art history. They might even have read exactly the same texts. Even if the work of these artists is formally different, there is a common ground. A set of shared experiences and concerns exist that in turn allows consensus to be formed. With the work of artists operating outside of the mainstream art world, none of these unifying experiences apply. Their work actively resists this process of assimilation, partly because, their respective motivation, partly because the respective motivations of these artists remain wholly idiosyncratic. This, of course, presents any number of problems to the institutions who have taken it upon themselves to interpret and consolidate visual culture. 
The nature of outsider art allows it to operate independently of the mainstream narratives and desires of our history. For example, there's no connection that I'm aware of between the work of, say, James Castle, Eugene von Brunschenheim, Prophet Royal Robertson, or Haas Adamite, to name but four examples. Each artist represents a radically autonomous position. Of course, this can create complications for the viewer too, as it requires us effectively to learn a new language with each encounter. This disruptive quality is clearly one of the work's most compelling characteristics. Consequently, I don't think we can generalize about these artists or the origins of their work, as there is literally no common ground, and it makes no sense to try and establish any. Given this scenario, the work of both Judith Scott and Dan Miller remains enigmatic. We have the physical reality of their respective bodies of work to deal with. We know something of their lives, more so in the case of Judith Scott, yet we know almost nothing of the artist's motives or intentions. For example, we cannot say with any conviction what their work is about or what their works mean. Similarly, we cannot with any confidence, as Catherine Morris suggested, co-opt them or their works into, into any established or existing art history, insider or outsider. For their work, by its autonomous nature, actively resists this process of art historical co-option. Their works ultimately exist outside of the conventions of any established art histories. Their works, like the circumstances of their creation, are deeply and profoundly unorthodox. It is this rejection of orthodoxy and ultimately consensus that underscores the entire project of creative growth and indeed the Katz's visionary ideas. Orthodox wisdom would never have entertained the idea that Judith Scott could be or become one of the most important artists of the late 20th century, yet she is. For almost 50 years now, Creative Growth and Creativity Explored and NIAD and the other organizations that they inspired have persistently reminded us that the cats were in fact right. Everything they anticipated when they established Creative Growth 50 years ago has in fact come to be. Centers like Creative Growth are living proof and visceral reminders that their ideas are not only reasonable but also sustainable. To paraphrase the Katzes, there is still no better time to create opportunities for people with disabilities. But perhaps what struck me most 20 years ago on my initial visit to Creative Growth, the day that I met Judith Scott and Dan Miller, was, uh, was that all of the incredible artists who I encountered at Creative Growth live within something like a 10 mile radius of the center itself. That is, they were all local artists. Was it merely a coincidence that some of the most significant artists of our time, including Judith Scott, Dan Miller, William Scott, Donald Mitchell, Dwight McIntosh, Nicole Storm, and Monica Valentine, among many others who've worked at Creative Growth, just happened to live in Oakland? Of course not. What the Katzes had long understood was that there was an equal number of extraordinary artists with disabilities in every community, in every city, in every state, and in every country. But without the opportunities and support provided by places like Creative Growth, their creative potential would, neither, would be neither acknowledged nor realized. We clearly need more places like Creative Growth. There's an urgent need for like-minded organizations within every community. In the 2012 Freeze Roundtable, I discussed my personal relationship with Creative Growth and its artists this way. This was a decade ago. Um, quote, my ongoing work as a curator with Creative Growth and its artists is wholly informed by the Katz's original ambitions. I see this as a lifelong commitment on my part, born from a straightforward desire to introduce as many people as possible to the Katz's ideas and the extraordinary work produced in the three centers they founded. At White Columns in New York over the past 17 years, we've now organized more than 40 exhibitions and projects with artists with disabilities in each case collaborating closely with the centers that support them, including Creative Growth and NIAD, Cincinnati's Visionary Voices, Boston's Gateway Arts, Los Angeles' First Street and Tierra del Sol, New York's HAI and Fountain Gallery, Glasgow's Project Ability, and most recently uh, with London's Into Art, among others. For a long time, we were the only contemporary art space, and certainly in New York, that regularly presented the work of artists with disabilities in our programs, alongside the work of artists with more conventional or formal training. Even now, almost 20 years later, we remain an outlier in this regard, 
one of only a few contemporary art spaces who approach our programming in this way. We do this because not only do we feel that the work is important and that there is also an engaged audience for this work, but also because in showing this work, it makes White Columns a more interesting place. And also, and perhaps most crucially, it makes White Columns a more complicated idea. What the Cats has set in motion in the early 1970s by now should be a global movement. That it isn't only reminds us that there is much work yet to be done. And that the contemporary museum, if it hopes to remain relevant, can and should play an important and decisive role in these conversations going forward. My personal feeling is it will probably take at least another decade before the Contemporary Art Museum fully addre formally addresses its reluctance and its resistance to supporting art made by people with disabilities. But I'm optimistic that it will eventually happen. From my now 20 year experience of working in this field, I've learned that ultimately you have to be patient. As creative growth approaches its 50th anniversary, it's clear that we all have a lot of catching up to do. Thank you. I can't find the bathroom slide. <laughs> this is the former gallery sign from Creative Growth made by John Martin, which tells you that Creative Growth has the best art in Oakland. <laughs> and it's true. Thank you very much. I think we're due back when, At Gloria? Five Please return at 5.05. Also, when we come back, we will be doing questions. So if you have your comp, take your comment card from your uh, inside your uh, program for today, write your questions on it. I will collect it, or you can find a couple of volunteers around. And for those of you online, please post your questions in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah, you have 15 minutes. So, I don't, don't, thank you. I think they start working. Okay, I think we're ready. Is it, can everybody hear me? No. no. All right. I'm not checked out on this tool. Oh, oh, I, it was on. I, I, okay. I think we're back. We're, One, two. All right. Um, Tom, do you want to kick things off or? Oh, sure, I'll ask the first question. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you. I'm Tom DiMaria. Um, we want to uh, start by paying respect to Margaret Robson, of course, because of her vision in terms of collecting the work. And she was also someone who, you know, very much, if you, you know, read um, Doug's uh, essay about her, really much was involved with the artist and liked to get her hands dirty and was, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, I want to say an artist, artist, but a, an artist, uh, a collector who was really um, engaged with the art. And then in relationship to the collection, she also understood that the tides were turning and self-taught work was increasingly being viewed in contemporary contexts. So I want, we want to talk to the, ask the panel, like where are we on this trajectory today in terms of work um, being presented, self-taught work being presented in a more contemporary way? Um, do we think that's just you know a moment in time that's relevant right now, but that will pass? Where do we think we're going in the future? 
how will the Robson family collection be presented in 20 years from now? Matthew, any ideas? <laughs> well, I'm happy to start. Um, I, I think I would uh, take it back, Leslie, to something that you said right at the beginning this morning, and I, I mentioned it again in my presentation, that the, the fact that just two of the artists in this incredible collection of work are with us. And I think that thus far in the kind of evolving narrative around the the relationship between the work of self-taught artists and the institution, the museum, uh, thus far has mostly been a historical conversation. The, the work typically presented tends to be work by artists that have passed. So for example, when Massimiliano Gioni curated his Venice Biennial, I think probably a decade ago now, I can't remember exactly when it was, he presented a lot of work by self-taught artists, but the majority of it was by artists that were deceased. So. Certainly from my perspective and the kind of work we do at White Collins, we're very interested in the idea of living artists with disabilities, living artists who are self-taught. So I think there's a kind of schism uh, that will get resolved and it's getting uh, uh, blurrier between historical work and the work of living artists who are working within this tradition. So I think for me, going forward, I think that's, that's where the Contemporary Art Museum can really play a critical role by uh, making a decision to start working with and collaborating with artists of all kinds and the organizations that support them uh, to make this much more a present tense conversation rather than it being a historical conversation, although both are obviously critical to the larger narrative. I wanted to add something to that. Um, one thing that I read that Colin Rhodes wrote in a catalog about Thornton Dial's work, The Works on Paper, that was done at uh, in Chapel Hill. He had a, um, a chapter on canonicity, and he there was something that really stuck with me, and that he said often when we talk about self-taught artists, we talk about their body of work. We don't necessarily talk about individual artworks as kind of standalone pieces or interpret them, and that's being done with someone like Thornton Dial. Like you'll see more things, videos about very specific pieces. Um, we heard that today with Katie's presentation. Um, so I think there needs to be a shift in thinking about interpretation of, you know, we, we've talked about and marvel over the body of work that these people make, but do we really get into the specifics that does contextualize them in a lived experience? And I think that's gonna be more of the trend or that's the direction that scholarship needs to move in uh, is to value individual pieces. I want to add a question from an audience member that relates to that specifically, and I don't know if any of you know, what percent of major museums in the US even have a department of self-taught art? So I mean, you know, before, to do the research and present the work on its own terms, are, is the research being done? What's out there in terms of scholarship? Well, I think um, Leslie and I, are until recently the only curators at general museums that have this specialization. Um, the MFA Boston just established a position, a curator of folk and self-taught art. Um, but it's been established in a different way um, because the, the curator who's coming into that role, Michael J. Bramwell, is gonna be kind of tasked with working across departments and not necessarily you know, commanding a, a distinct collection um, in the way that Leslie and I do at our respective institutions. And, I think that for me at the High, which has, I didn't speak much about the High's history, but the High established its Department of Folk and Self-Taught Art in the 90s um, and had been collecting since the 70s the work of living self-taught artists in the South. But there was a board member at the time um, in the 90s who realized that you know the New York art world was going crazy for Thornton Dial and um, you know Bill Trailer, and these were artists in our region and we should be leaders which has been great for the high and is, is really truly, you know, such an extraordinary luxury to be able to work on an artist like Nellie Mayro with the depth that I get to do at the high. But the challenge is that, you know, I am, I am separate from our modern and contemporary department or our American art department. And so I think the challenge is how, at institutions that do have this, um, this kind of privilege of having people who are specialized in the history of artists who are self-taught um, and have that expertise, you know, how does it kind of 
filter out across the museum. Um, so, so in the Folk and Self-Taught Galleries at the High, we reinstalled them in 2018. And other than the monographic displays of Howard Fincer and Nellie Mayro that we have, none of my galleries only have work by self-taught artists. They, they integrate artists from across the collection. Um, and I think that that is something that, I, that you're working towards and have already been doing here as well. And that will be something that will be interesting to see. How can these museums that have been making all of these acquisitions, like the Souls Grown Deep acquisition that's on view at the National Gallery, how are they going to be integrating this work within their modern and contemporary art galleries, within their American art galleries? Um, and I don't think that we're gonna go back to your first part of your question because the field is just changing so much and there's so much reckoning with exclusion. Um, and self-taught artists tend to come from different kinds of marginalized backgrounds, often intersectionally marginalized backgrounds. And so for that reason, um, I, I'm very optimistic about, um, you know, I think you're, you're probably right, Matt, Matthew, about it might take another 10 years for, um, for, for mainstream institutions to get with the program in a lot of ways, but it's, we're on that trajectory. I, I think also it's, you know, thus far, you know, with a lot of the kind of MFA curatorial programs, this field has not been a priority. And that surprises me because you'd think at a place like Bard College, Center for Cultural Curatorial Studies, that this field would be absolutely perfect for this moment because an organization like uh, Creative Growth was activist. You know, it was, it was a political organization that oriented around art. And it seems to me that its, its mission from 50 years ago is actually almost perfect for this moment. So it seems to me that the, the change needs to come also at the beginning, at the bottom of the, the, the narrative to the museum, which is with emerging curators, younger curatorial voices, and the organizations and colleges that support them. And uh, thus far, it's not been a priority to my knowledge. And you know, it's, it's pretty extraordinary that in a country the size of the United States, there's only three dedicated curators working institutions that look at looking at self-taught art. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing in itself. And there's a handful of academics that teach uh, self-taught art classes. I'm one of them. Um, and some of my students end up as interns at Intuit or other places. So you know, I think the internships that are created by different museums are part of that new crop of um, future curators, future scholars, and hopefully we'll see more and more. As the, the scholarship has advanced, I have a lot more to choose from in my classes and, and different videos and interviews and great pieces of scholarship that my students can read um, and even full textbooks that they can use. We use Charles Russell's book and augment that with other things. But I think we need to see more of that in academic settings too. Uh, we wanted to discuss a little bit the idea of disability within the larger context. Do you want, do you want to uh, raise that now? Um, as the field becomes more blended and more contemporary, if we think about what, some of the things that Matthew have said um, in terms of the bi issues around biography and disability, and if we look at culturally specific um, contexts in which works were made, does work by artists with disabilities, many of whom make work in supported studios where they have access to materials, does that um, fit into a self-taught context or a contemporary context in the same way, or are there specific concerns about presenting artists by disabilities um, in a different way? Well, um, I mean, I can speak to you know my really, my experience working at White Combs over the last seventeen years and. You know the collaborations that began uh, with Creative Growth. That when I encountered Creative Growth, as I mentioned in my presentation, it was like a, not only was I blindsided, but it was like a wake-up call. Uh, it seemed to really fundamentally challenge everything I'd been, you know, dealing with or thinking about in relation to art up until that point, and it just sent me off in a different direction. And it seemed to me that White Columns is a kind of art, a alternative art space, and as I always understood the alternative art spaces in the 70s and 80s was to pr provide an alternative to whatever was going on elsewhere. And it seemed to me that when I got to New York in 2005 that we had a real opportunity to pr provide an alternative again, which was to support this work. And at the time, we were really the only people doing it. And um, 20 years later, we were one of very few people doing it. But 
for me, it seemed to fit perfectly with WhiteCom's historical mission, which was to privilege, support, create a context or an environment for voices that were otherwise ignored, overlooked, marginalized. And it seemed to me the thing that interested me a great deal about creative growth and the other senses is that they were activist organizations. They weren't necessarily, you know, I think that James Train is the, expecting to find a sort of depressing exercise in art therapy. That's really not what it was. It was like, really like a, a political narrative that was unfolding in the, in the context of art. So it seemed to me that that allowed us to do something very specific at White Comms, which is to collaborate with organizations, progressive studios that support individuals with disabilities who are artists. Uh, obviously, the wider narrative is, in fact, I think it's so broad and complex, it's incredibly difficult for us to kind of generalize because all of the work that was discussed today is radically different. Its circumstances are radically different. The individuals that made it were radically different. and. Uh, None of the categories thus far satisfactorily embrace all of the work, just the work that we discussed today. So I think it's complicated, but certainly from my sort of uh, polemical, the polemical part of my presentation, it's, it's really about asking why contemporary art institutions are not working with progressive art studios right now, because they should be. Okay, I have um, a, a question here that maybe intersects with a couple different things. So um, let me start this by saying that, uh, you know, for Katie, I know that you and I have both um, thought a lot about the ways that self taught female artists of color have faced tenfold more challenges than other artists, um, and that they're underrepresented in the gallery because of that is like, you know, an extension of that reality. And one of the additional questions that we have from an audience member um, asks about the lack of Latinx artists in the symposium specifically, but, you know, that extends to the exhibition in which Martin Ramirez would be the only um, one, which is, again, a case, you know, in this particular um, array of artists, it's a historical moment and it's a body of work that it, you know, who's represented in that collection is somewhat happenstance, but it also reflects whose work was being saved and whose work was being valued at the time and who cared about it, right? So um, this intersects a little bit with a question that I would put to you about Nellie May Rowe and Judith Alexander and, you know, this aesthetic of, um, the, the challenge of that aesthetic, like who valued it, who saw it, who cared about it, and who saved it, right? Um, because it's not even how that happened. Um, and, and those gaps are very telling. They're, they're an important part of a problematic history. Um, but it's an interesting one in Nellie Mae Rowe's case that maybe you want to talk about a little bit. OK. Um, so I'm not, so I can speak to the extent to which, you know, so many museum collections, all museum collections are really collections of collections, right? And, um, and so much has already been predetermined, as you were saying, in terms of what's saved by individual people like Judith Alexander, who was the dealer who kind of started responding to Rose's work in the late 70s and then working with her, representing her at her gallery. Um, and what I alluded to in my presentation was that um, she just, after Roe died, she really had a hard time selling the work to lots of interested parties, which was kind of a, a problem, you know, in, it, in its own right. I mean, it's part of why Roe's work didn't enter into more museum collections sooner. But then at the end of her life, she was able to just give everything to the high so that Roe would remain in, in the public domain and have this possibility for her legacy to be um, really preserved um, for the public. So all to say that, it's the highest collection in particular is not it's it's diverse in the sense that you know our proportion of women artists to male artists isn't so egregiously lopsided like it's still majority male um, but there's like 40 percent representation of women which is much better than what you see in most American or modern and contemporary collections in terms of racial and ethnic diversity we don't have it um, beyond the fact that there's a majority of African-American artists in, in the collection. 
And this is, you know, this is again the kind of result of the way that people collected um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it doesn't mean that the museum doesn't have a responsibility to be looking beyond, you know, what it has gotten, what it has, um, the legacies that it already supports. But it is, it is the truth, because um, we don't have Asian American artists well represented um, within our folk and self-taught art collection. Um, and Atlanta has a huge Asian American population. Um, and so this is a question that comes up for me a lot there. All to say that, yeah, it's, it's like even within these collections that are at their core so diverse in the way that they embrace and uphold the art of people who you know, come from these marginalized backgrounds, come from these unconventional pathways to art, um, they're still, you know, have these problems of, of not being diverse enough, for sure. Uh, Katie, there's a related question to that from the audience, um, an audience member. Were the works of Rose that the dealer donated, were they hers to give? Yes, I mean, yes, the, the family got a lot of work when Roe died um, and still has, and, you know, she she was representing Roe um, and paying her for her work when Roe was alive. And so there's there has not been this issue around ownership and provenance. And again, the family of the Alexanders and the family of Roe are, remain um, very close. And they actually like jointly run a foundation, the Judith Alexander Foundation, that supports things like the documentary that I was talking about. Um, and is really about, uh, you know, advancing the legacy of, of Rose's work. And they've got some exciting things in, ahead in the future. You'll probably be hearing about them uh, a lot more because they're, they're going to be working more with other institutions. Um, Mark, you know, you mentioned that uh, it was a long time overdue, right, for an artist like Yoakum to have an exhibition in his hometown at this museum where so many people had connections to him over the years. Um, do you, what changed to make that happen? I'm old. <laughs> um, I actually threatened to leave. Oh. They asked me to do another show that I didn't want to do and I said I would. Mike. It's, it's not on. Like that? Yeah. <laughs> you have to point it, sorry. Um, I don't know. I think Chicago has a history of um, not respecting its history. Uh, they tear buildings down that are super important. They don't recognize the talent that exists in the community. And um, if they don't get a visionary person um, in the city in an in a important position, like a museum director, it'll continue to, to fall away. And I'm not, I didn't grow up there, but um, I know enough about the history to know how much of it is ignored and, and, and invisible. And uh, the fact that we had all of those drawings in the collection since 1979 and a manuscript waiting to be published since 1979, um, to me was an atrocity. And uh, one of my um, previous colleagues who had been at the museum for 50 years in overlap with this very famous curator named Harold Joachim, who was a European trained old master specialist. Um, it was his feeling that Harold did not um, elevate Joachim's work because people mispronounced his name as Joachim, Joachim. And so he was insulted by it. But um, I've sat in the study room with um, the director of the Albertina uh, with Henry Darger drawings out on the ledge and the guy walked up and said, who is this great artist? So it doesn't take much I mean, all you have to do is put it in front of people. Um, and it it's magically comes alive because it's there and it's real. And um, I, don't, I don't understand why, you know, Matthew's fighting the good fight. Um, I don't have enough years left in me at the, at the Art Institute to do anything about it because it would take cross-departmental agreement and collaboration. And in a museum like the San Francisco Art Museum of Modern Art, this Art Institute of Chicago, it's composed of fiefdoms where people protect their little fiefdom um, uh, carefully and they don't like to get out of it. And so, I mean, you're, we're talking about work that gets produced in a lot of different media. And without a curator like Katie, um, who's like focused on all of it, it's hard to bring it into an encyclopedic museum. I think a Kunsthalle would be much better at presenting on a consistent basis all of this stuff, including um, people with disabilities. 
but um, it's everything that you're saying is right. It's just there are so many things in the community in Chicago that are going to be ignored. Um, the fact that we got 200 and something drawings by Joseph Yoakum is a miracle, and it's because one person, as your gallerist saw, it was important, and he preserved it, he paid for it, and um, it's all documented. So it's, um, I don't know, we had an artist who tried to give the Art Institute a collection of contemporary ceramics made in Africa by African artists from different countries, and the museum wouldn't take half of it because he bought it with cash in villages and he couldn't produce provenance. And the museum was worried about somebody from Africa coming and like taking it back and go through all the process, legal processes of, of acquiring this stuff, which was, which is why it's an important answer that you gave about how all of that stuff got into the hands of the dealer. She definitely paid for it and it's, it was hers. That's the other problem. It's, it's, there's so many problems with all of this. Um, I mean, Matthew has the right idea. I th also think that your idea about another generation is the significant one. There has to be another generation to support all this stuff and enlighten people and also enlighten trustees because trustees often run museums in ways that are not good. Well, I'm quite optimistic about the new SF MOBA, so we'll see. Good. But, um, you know, I think it, it, it all goes back to sort of, you know, an unspoken truth, which is that museums are largely quite conservative and that they behave conservatively and that they mostly program, and of course I'm generalizing, but they mostly program from consensus. And consensus is only constructed in the world of contemporary art through the art market. So if something hasn't worked its way through the market narrative, it's never going to find itself into a position of consensus in order for the museum to embrace it. So the real problem for all of the work we've been discussing, which as we discussed is very different in its intentions and its origins, is that very little of it has worked its way through the process of consensus. And as I mentioned before, I think a lot of this work act actively resists consensus. So it presents all kinds of problems for a conservative institution. So it either means that we need less conservative institutions or we need different kinds of institutions with a different mindset and you know, perhaps more emerging voices. But again, that's 10, 20, 30 years to turn those ideas around. And you know, I won't be here probably when that happens. So in the meantime, I think all we can do is do the work and you know, do the work as intelligently as we can, as efficiently as we can, and hope it finds an audience. You know, one of the blessings we have working at White Combs in New York is that we have an audience. And you know, we have support from people like Roberta Smith, Holland Cotto, when he wrote more frequently. You know, they would cover this stuff at White Combs the week after it was on the walls. And that doesn't happen in other American cities. So I could do this in a smaller American city and it would reverberate locally, hopefully, but it wouldn't necessarily reverberate beyond that. So the whole infrastructure of the contemporary art world is broken. And you know, we, we probably all know that. So then how do individuals who are marginalized socially, politically, culturally, and economically, how do they actually you know, participate within that broken structure? So, it's super frustrating, but on the positive and upside is that you know it's really interesting work to do, and it's really meaningful. And uh, incrementally, I think we can make a difference. I have something that I wanted to ask um, Matthew and Tom about when when the slide that you stayed on for a lot of your talk the had slide. Yeah, not the bathroom <laughs> slide, but the slide that had the Judith. Um, Scott piece in the foreground, and then more figurative representational work in the back. And it kind of struck me that both Judas Scott and his name's escaping me now, uh, the other artist in the show that's from Creative Graph, Dan Miller, yeah. they both work in the language of abstraction, uh -huh. which maybe is more palatable to the general art world, more familiar. Um, you know, we may think of their work as having a lot of mystery to it but it's a mystery that the art world is comfortable with when you think about abstraction and mark making and working with materials. And I was just wondering if you think, you know, those are probably the two more successful artists that have come out of, in terms of the art world, right. valuation of them. Um, do you think there's something there with the vocabulary they work in, 
that allows the art world to kind of be more inclusive of them in, in exhibitions and, and reviews? Um, I mean, I would answer that simply by saying that more consensus mm -hmm. is stuck to their work. And uh, I think that's through it being exposed, seen, contextualized, co collected, supported. Uh, my feeling is that that process would work for pretty much any artist at creative growth, regardless of whether they're working figuratively or abstractly. Certainly, I think their work, uh, it's tempting, I think, to align Judith Scott and Dan Miller's work with more recent forms of modernist art that you know, we're familiar with, to try and make a connection between Dan Miller and, say, Cy Twombly, but it's totally erroneous, in my opinion. <laughs> but it's there. It could be done. So I think that there's the potential within their work for those kind of narratives and conversation to happen, whereas with other work it's... But um, I'm not so sure about that. I think it's really just through lack of exposure uh, with regard to the other work. My, my answer to that, my take is that it, because those two artists have a more contemporary look, it's more palatable, mm -hmm. and it can depersonalize the issue around disability, so you can ignore that. And I think some of the other works behind in that image are some very personal works by an artist named Camille Holvert that Matthew wants to show in New York that's deeply complicated and personal. And um, looking at a, a larger abstract work, you don't have to have that engagement if you don't want to. So I think there's um, part of what you're asking um, is uh, there's a response there um, that relates to me on that level. That's very interesting. Um, okay, this question uh, is for anybody. Um, what do you think we should be taking away from this symposium? Um, and this maybe kind of touches on what you said about, you know, the work is there's so much autonomy that there's not this common touchstone. So, uh, you know, from an art world perspective, how are we looking at this work um, as opposed, like, how do we understand it? artist by artist instead of as something just uh, as a foil to the larger art world. Any ideas? Well, I, think, I think Catherine Morris addressed this in her brilliant essay about um, Judah Scott work which was published eight years ago, um, where there's this desire slash demand from the consensus making structures to put all of this work in a bucket and give it a name. And it just doesn't work. I mean, the work just doesn't satisfy those desires, but also the work actually resists those desires. So I think the, the field will remain fractured, fragmentary. And I think that's why it will remain interesting and important, because it isn't an ism. Um, you know, the, it's, it's tempting to bracket all work produced in the American South together but it's not really an ism. And I think that's, for me, it's one of, it was one of the first things I noticed at Creative Growth is that there's 50 artists working alongside each other in a space, and they're all working autonomously, but they're doing it together. And it's this idea of collective autonomy, I think, that's the most interesting thing about the progressive art studios. And it might actually be the most progressive thing about this field. So we just need to kind of like expand the parameters of what the museum can deal with to embrace collective autonomy because I think it would be a much more interesting way to approach this material because then it would allow all kinds of other material to come into the conversation too. Um. I mean, one of my takeaways is, is that, you know, our presentations, which were so focused on a singular artist, um, I think they each provided different touch points for those artists, right? And, and ways that these artists can be related visually, vis-a-vis -vis their reception history, vis-a-vis -vis their historical moments, to other things that you will see at a museum, right? Whether it's um, the work of the Harry Who, or you know, centuries of religious art based on um, saints and um, their insane <laughs> physical attributes and miraculous um, abilities. So all to say that like to me that's what's exciting about about focusing and going deep on specific artists is that it's this this way of relating them to larger histories right um and so i hope that the takeaway for anyone who works in fields of modern contemporary or american art is that these are artists that can have meaningful conversations that might be transhistorical that might be transcultural 
um, but that they do not need to be only seen in group shows of self-taught artists or group, you know, departmental galleries of self-taught artists or monographic exhibitions, but their work, you know, it has relationships um, to, to larger histories. So that would be the takeaway that I hope people have. My takeaway is um, something that Katie said, which is to call the work outsider sort of denies its historical significance. And I think some of the artists we talked about today all have historical significance, whether it's Darger or the creation of, of creative growth or African American, you know, artists working like who were, you know, from from enslaved roots into, you know, being contemporary makers. Those are all historically important moments. And I think that there's a commonality there that is defies a larger sort of title, but the, those individual historical moments are important. Lisa, um, in your book you talk about the aesthetics of cuteness in Darger's art. Can you explain how um, that kind of, that idea of cuteness functions in his images of girls and maybe also elaborate on something I think you said calling them almost orphans in his resources? Uh, I, I became uh, very interested in, um, you know, I looked at a lot of his art, but I wanted to see what was in his studio, so to speak, in, in his apartment. And after you flip through um, the loose leaf material, you start looking at the um, archive he develops of all these cut out forms is that what hits you is the kind of saccharine sweetness of the images that he was drawn to and there is a you know kind of a psychological pull that happens with a cute image and you know scholars talk about it as a kind of maternal impulse to protect that image um, I read somewhere, and I, I can't remember who said this, but it was a great quote, that we put beauty on a pedestal, and we put cute things on our lap, that we want an intimacy with that and to be protective of that. And it just dawned on me that, you know, how, whether he was aware of this or not, how clever um, he is to exploit that. So you've got these characters that are always in peril, always in these vulnerable situations, and you keep your reader, even if it's an imagined reader, engaged for 15,000 plus pages because you threaten that cute object that you inherently are drawn to, that you want to protect. Um, and there's also some literature written about how cuteness is equated with pity. Like if you think, my veterinarian has a book on the, the table I noticed the other day, and it was little kittens that had bandaged ears and they had little crutches, and you're like, oh, it's cute. But cuteness is, affiliated with pity and and some um, some writing talks about you know some scholars have talked about that there is a desire to hurt the cute object to make it more pitiful so it made me think differently about Darger's work which you know he values these children but then he also puts them through all these terrible tragic things and and they are kind of martyred and some of her crucified and disemboweled and and you know so it's he, I think he exploits that cute factor and it's also something that draws us in as 21st century viewers. We can still relate to that cuteness. Um, you know, it translates from living things like kitties, kittens and puppies and little kids to inanimate objects like teddy bears and dolls or someone who traces dolls pretty much um, that uh, we, we can be affected by that cute um, aesthetic. And maybe that caused some concerns about his work early on, you know, people questioning, um, maybe more perversion that was kind of, you know, talked about in his work, that we feel the pull of that cuteness too, um, and feel discomfort um, with it. But the, the orphan, um, you know, this almost orphan uh, idea about uh, Shirley Temple is that she's always you know, people are vying to protect her. She's also this cute, superlative cute object in many ways. And um, there's lots of orphan stories that Darger collected. Of course, he lost his mother. The Little Flower Christ lost her mother at age four, which is kind of the beginning of her story of conversion. Um, 
And, and so um, in the papers in Chicago at this time period at Darger is, you know, writing a story and illustrating a story. Uh, there's lots of horrific stories about orphans and Catholic um, charities shipping them over to the American West, uh, moving them out of New York City, moving them out of Chicago. Um, also children that have been abducted. You know, there's lots of uh, discussion about um, his uh, Darger's um, kind of obsession with Elsie Perubeck and the, the, the photograph of her from the newspaper. So childhood is always teetering on this edge of um, innocence and then um, tragedy or, you know, the, the taking away of that innocence. Um, and so it's always in danger uh, in what Darger is absorbing and reading and looking at. And I think that definitely translates in his work. But the orphans are these characters that are separated from family and they're able to go on their own journeys like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz um, or um, any kinds of stories that are coming out of uh, Dickens novels that they kind of become separated from their families and so then they have this autonomy um, and this permission to go on and go on these great journeys and I think um, you know as someone who lived a life of an almost orphan um, he did have a father, but um, eventually lost his father. Darter affiliated with that, and the orphan as this figure that was of importance at the moment. Do you have one? I have a completely different question. Um, what do curators mean when they use the word visionary? Does anyone here use the word visionary? We see that a lot, self-taught in visionary art, Center for Visionary Art. Anyone want to comment on that? Um, I, I mean, I don't think that the only usage of it is to apply to artists who attribute, you know, their their artistic genius to some kind of divine mandate and divine experience, a visionary experience where they're communicating directly with a larger spiritual force that's commanding them. There are many examples of, of artists who who experience um, and relay experiences of these kinds of visions as being the source of their of their artistic kind of awakening. Um, so that's that's the most precise, I think, application of it, but that's not, you know, the way it's used in Baltimore for the American Visionary Art Museum. They obviously encompass a much broader array of artists who have tremendous vision, right, for, um, for, for their own kind of uh, world views. So, but and I will say too about the visionary thing, this is another, Another thing that really has to be better contextualized moving forward, and there has been good work done on what a visionary experience really is um, for artists who are working in communities that don't necessarily understand or value um, artistic work. And the vision becomes a kind of a way uh, to create an origin story around a project, right? That, so that it can make sense to oneself and also to a larger community. And that I'm not denying spiritual experiences, but I think that the more that we understand these, these artists as, as, again, people in history and people who are experiencing um, the limitations of their specific social positions, like the more you start to see, wow, there's much more to this than just potentially a divine kind of intervention. I mean, I certainly use the term in my presentation today, but I, I think I'd have to check my text, but I think I use it in relation to the cats as thinking, uh, which I think is visionary. And my understanding of my use of the term visionary in that context is that the cats has anticipated, saw and understood something fully before it existed, and then they realized it. So their thinking before creative growth opened in 74, so let's say the late 60s to the early 70s, when they were developing these ideas at home in Berkeley, was visionary. That there was no precedent for what they were trying to do. There was no precedent for what they understood. There was no organization or model for them to mirror. But they fully understood what needed to be done based on the understanding that they were right. So they understood that in the East Bay, there were a hundred brilliant artists who just happened to have disabilities. They actually understood that, and to me that's visionary. So their conception of creative growth was visionary, and then the way that they structured creative growth, with its completely hands-off, no teaching, no interpretation, was also visionary, because they avoided this sort of art therapeutic model 
Um, and it was really about something that just didn't exist. So they were visionaries, I think, in the absolute classical sense. Um, so I would definitely use it in that term. I do think when it gets applied to art, it can get very kind of woolly um, and, and loose, which may be not so useful. I, I would agree with that, that it often can be um, more confusing, one of those terms that can, you know, just lead you down the wrong path. But I, you know, two examples come to mind. Um, James Hampton and Howard Finster, who are both artists who spoke about that in terms of their own work and spoke about how they had a vision and then they followed it, right? So their art became a following of that vision that they believed they were supposed to execute through that body of work. So I think that in cases like that, and that's not unlike the Katzes, you know, using it in, the, in that term, sort of this, having this vision and then following it as a committed act. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that question? Okay. Oh, I have, okay, I have a question for Mark. Um, Yoakum's imagery is often uh, referred to as restless looking or animated, and sometimes it almost looks like it is more of an animal than a landscape. From what you know about his spirituality or maybe cultural heritage, did he view the natural world as a living thing? I honestly, I, I can't answer that factually because I didn't know him. But um, a typical Q and A with him, um, someone saying uh, those mountains look very animistic. Is that a face I see? And his answer would be very matter of fact. If you say so. <laughs> I don't think we can deny that those those after images or specific images rest in the drawings, and that the way that he drew them makes them very animated because they are the line is very active and um, it's also very alla prima. He didn't he didn't do rehearsals. He just drew, and he drew with things that couldn't be erased. His tools were unerasable. So um, yeah, I it's. He didn't, he wouldn't admit to much of anything except that he was a Navajo Indian and he had these uh, travel experiences and so forth. He, he wouldn't really address the subject matter of his drawings aside from the locations with people. Um, but I think, I think they've been interpreted by some people very beautifully that way. Um, the very first show that John Ullman did uh, of his work uh, was called Animistic Landscapes. And um, I'm blanking on his name now, but the, the, the great gallerist in New York. Um, Randall was, Morris. Randall Morris wrote a very beautiful piece in there. And, and in a conversation that we had for the Brooklyn Rail, um, he had tremendous insight about Yoakum's um, cultural background that I don't have, and which impressed and amazed me. And um, I, did, I, I had never thought of the drawings in quite the way that he talked about them, but it included things like the animistic qualities of them. And I, I just can't deny it. They're just there. If you see it, um, it's, it's up to you to believe it or deny it. Not Joseph Yoakum. Uh, there's a question from Matthew. Matthew, um, your comment on equity, um, which you said that the lack of interest or ability to move forward with collecting comes from a lack of academic reach. Can a museum operate without formal ground? Did I say that? <laughs> so I think the question, I'm trying to understand the question. Um, so I, I think when you talk about equitable presentations of work, do you think, uh, and you were talking about so the institutions maybe not stepping up to the plate, right. do you think that maybe perhaps that comes from a lack of academic reach, that they're not um, uh, studying the field? It might relate to our earlier question about you know, do, do museums really have you know, people that bring this work and study this work? Um, well, maybe I'll try and answer it in a slightly different way, but um, I think I understand the question. Um, when I first went to Creative Growth so in 2002, w one of the things that I didn't mention in my speech that really struck me, because the cats had already anticipated it 30 years before, was that the makeup of the artists that work in Creative Growth looked like Oakland. 
it exactly mirrored the population of Oakland. It was, it's quite remarkable. If you go to Creative Growth tomorrow, you'll see exactly the same thing. All kinds of people are represented because disability obviously doesn't discriminate. But the center and the cat's imagination or vision for the center embraced this before it was even an idea, socially and culturally and politically in the United States. They understood it fully. And for me, I think this is why I don't really understand why contemporary art organizations now that need to change, even if they don't want to, they have to change, and they're being forced to change, why they don't actually investigate this territory and this field, because in a strange way, it resolves some of the problems that they can't resolve on their own, because these progressive studios are very equitable in the sense that they represent the communities that they exist in, in an almost precise and perfect manner. And, um, for me, that was, that, that was another interesting, you know, it's another interesting part about these organizations, about creative growth, but also about the problems that exist within larger institutions, which, you know, the other panelists have addressed, which is either it's a resistance to showing Joachim's work in Chicago, which seems unfathomable. How could they have sat on that stuff for 30, 40 years and not shown it? And of course, when they do show it, they're celebrated. And the same thing in the collections at the high or elsewhere. And the museum moves too slowly uh, to f change everything or to resolve all the problems. So it seems to me a way to accelerate that is to simply start working with organizations that have figured it out. And a great way to do that is to work with people like Creative Growth, uh, Visionaries and Voices in Cincinnati. Because these organizations have actually done the work for decades. And all you need to do is somehow find a way to allow the conservative museum to work with the nimble, community-oriented organization. No, it's not that complicated. And immediately, I think the museum becomes a more interesting place. And I think, as I said at the end of my piece, uh, the work we've done over the last 17 years at White Comms with organizations around the world has made White Comms a more interesting place. And it's made it a more complicated place for us to work in. And it's made us a more complicated place for us to explain ourselves to potential funders because what we're doing, unfortunately, isn't, isn't typical. All right, we're uh, nearing the end of our time. Do you have questions left? I, I have one question left, and I guess I have to answer it. Who staffs creative growth, and what kinds of skills, competencies are needed to support the community of artists? Creative growth is founded by artists for artists, so we're all artists, and uh, we have a the studio was open plan. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had 100 artists a day. They worked in all visual media, and the entire staff is um, practicing artist or art background. There's no therapeutic or other backgrounds. And we have a very specific um, hands-off approach to not touching or directing the artist, but to um, create uh, an aesthetically pleasing environment for the person to take their entire life at the time they need to create work. Okay, and I have one additional question about funding and how that um, influences or doesn't the choices of a museum in making acquisitions and deciding what to present in exhibitions. Um, how, how big of a factor is that? It's messy. There's no set rule, but funding plays a huge role. Um, and it plays more of a role in the conception of exhibitions than it does in, um, in, the, in the outcome, therefore. As far as acquisitions are concerned, I think it depends on the type of money that's being used by the museum. A museum that has to raise all the money um, has, has to worry about that a lot. A, a museum that has a lot of money, uh, discretionary money to use, um, can be a lot more independent and direct the acquisitions program to the degree the director will let them. I think um, to go back to something we were saying earlier about you know museums are largely collections of collections because the vast majority of what comes into a museum is our gifts, our donations, and I think there's a, a gross misconception about the amount of acquisition funds that even the largest and most you know well endowed uh, museums actually have, um, and that makes these projects of creating equity and um, you know they're just they get messy, they get, um, they get difficult. And from my perspective, uh, a lot of my 
dearest, you know, supporters and people who are donating work to the collection, who are, you know, there rallying um, with me around enthusiasm for for artists like Nellie Mae Rowe. Um, these are also not necessarily people who like have millions of dollars <laughs> to give to the museum, and in fact have been interested in this work um, in a way like because it was a collecting area that they were able to afford and to approach. Um, and so that, that resonates, you know, that has long-term kind of effects for the way that collections can be built over time if different support net networks for different areas within a museum are, are, are grossly unequal um, in terms of who, who's interested in funding what kind of art. So it's, it's difficult. One of the great images was in your presentation of the Gorilla Girls poster. Yeah suggesting, you know, the value of one Jasper Johns, you could acquire works by that extraordinary list of artists, which at the time was probably true. But, you know, I think now if a institution, in a very intelligent and serious way, decided to put together a collection of contemporary art made by artists with disabilities in the United States right now, you could put together a museum quality collection, whatever that might mean, for less than the price of one painting by a 35-year-old now. And, uh, it's the, the, the fact is the museums don't want to do it, and that's, that's it. They could do it tomorrow, and they wouldn't even have to fundraise for it. So the will doesn't exist, so it's how can we create the will? Because the economics of it at this point are largely irrelevant. So it's how do you create the circumstances inside an institution where they actually want to do that? Okay. Can I just say one more thing about yes. that? That's one place where trustees would be very important. Like if somebody, a very influential trustee who got behind something like that, could actually help make it happen. Anything to add? Okay. Um, okay, that's a great place to wrap it up, and I appreciate that. And I wanted to add one additional thing that um, the film that Katie mentioned, This World Is Not My Own, the film about Nellie Mae Rowe, that is going to screen at SAM this spring with a Q&A with the filmmakers. Gloria, do you happen to know the date March of that? 16th. March 16th. So that, that will be um, an exciting thing. And the filmmakers that made that will be here to talk about it. So you know, hope you all will join us for that. And um, please now join us in the uh, lobby for our reception. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.